Um, hi and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Hamet Hosravi. Uh, we are very excited and happy to open this long-awaited symposium uh, today with our distinct guest, uh, Nazgul Ansarinia, connecting from Tehran, Alessandra Covini from Rotterdam, Miles Gertler, Toronto, and David Burns here in London. Um, this is actually our th second round of uh, representations investigation symposium. The first one was uh, organized by my colleague and friend Platon Isayas in 2019. Uh, we had the plan to, uh, to have another one last year, which was because of all the COVID related issues was kind of postponed to this year in a digital uh, environment. Uh, representation investigation symposium uh, is a crucial moment for us as a school, as, as the entire AA, to discuss and examine the role of media uh, in architecture, territory, and, and urban scales, uh, not only as an end point of design process, which for us this time of the year is always the moment uh, of wrapping up the designs and uh, submitting uh, the projects, but also for us is a methodological inquiry uh, uh, that shapes and fosters research, design, experimentation, and of course, is to be materialized into space. But not only that, uh, but also acknowledging the fact that architecture is no longer limited to the built space. Uh, it's rather through uh, various impetuses fostered by imagination, investigations, and, and even projections. Um, and we are inviting uh, a larger on a wider, let's say, practice of art and architecture to discuss with uh, in this symposium and bringing together researcher, architects, artists, and curators to explore uh, the use of media and representation of space as a form of multi-scholar investigation. So our today guests will discuss their practices and reflect on their working methodologies, showing their key projects from their practice that use artistic media beyond the pure representation of architecture. Uh, uh, not only that, but instead as a systematic form of inquiry. Our first guest today is Nazgul Ansarinia, um, who is an artist, Iranian artist. She graduated from London College of Communication in London um, and then uh, pursued her master degree in fine arts at the California College of Arts, CCA in San Francisco in 2003. In her work, Ansarinia examines uh, the systems and networks that underpin her daily life, such as everyday objects, routines, and experience, experiences, and the relationship uh, they form to a larger social context. Their projects represent ways of understanding the role of architecture in delineating interior and exterior in line with the discussion um, to and according to public and private spheres. And Sarinia's works are largely observational and technical in their scopes, offering insights into issues that are most pressing and urgent today's uh, in our urgent today's uh, cities and population. Her recent exhibition uh, include "The Room Becomes a Street" in 2020, uh, "Fragile Frontier: Revolution Begins at Home," and "The Spark Is You," all in 2019, and "Fragments, Particles, and Mechanism of Growth" uh, in 2017. Our second guest uh, is Alessandra Covini that uh, we are very happy that she managed to join us today from Rotterdam because I know that she's opening at the same time one of her projects in another city. Uh, we are very happy, Alessandra, and grateful. Uh, Alessandra studied in Milan and Lisbon and received uh, her master's degree in architecture at the University of Delft. Uh, she's a founder of Rotterdam-based studio Ossidiana, an award-winning practice in architecture design and research, which uh, she's leading it together with uh, her partner, Giovanni Bellotti. Uh, founded in 2015, the practice is always uh, in research of new material expressions uh, to translate visions into engaging spaces and objects. Playfulness, tactility, and inclusivity play a major role in the studio's project. Stories are told and objects are brought to life through materials and spaces that call for action, discovery, and wonder. Uh, working across multiple scales, S uh, Studio Sidiana blurs the, the boundary between architecture, design, art, landscape, and urban strategies. Alessandra is also the winner of a prestigious award, uh, Prix de Rome uh, in Architecture in 2018, and also 
teaches and lectures in multiple schools of architecture like TU Delft, uh, Rotterdam Academy, Pittsburgh Institute, and Ritholt Academy in the Netherlands. Uh, our third guest, Miles Gertler, um, joining us from Toronto, um, studied at the University of Waterloo and Princeton University. In addition to his independent practice as an artist uh, in writing, sculpture, and image make making, uh, he is the director of Common Accounts, an office for design inquiry that he founded together with Igor uh, Brigado in 2015. Their work in academia and architectural inquiry, construction, and larger scale art installations examines intersections of the body with the space, both online and real life, and considers extra architectural material that often passes below the radar of the, our discipline. He teaches um, at the University of Toronto's Daniels Faculty of Architecture at the moment uh, and serves on the board of directors at Mercer Union, a center for contemporary arts, I guess, in Toronto. Um, and our fourth year and the moderator of discussion here is our friend, uh, David Burns, uh, who works in media and space. His current research examines the role of media in historiographies of sites of nuclear colonialism. His PhD from the Center of uh, Research Architecture at Goldsmiths was concerned with uh, Woomera rocket range in South Australia, specifically the British nuclear weapons test in the 1950s and 1960s uh, in Maralinga. The dissertation was accompanied by an extensive archive of found photography, drawings, court records, newsletters, uh, scientific studies, and memorabilia combined with new photography and moving images that were completed during his field trip in South Australia. For two, two decades almost, uh, David has written and led transdisciplinary curricula in architecture, art, and design in universities in the United States Australia and the United Kingdom. He leads currently media studies at the Royal College of Art and uh, the School of Architecture and was previously the director of photography and situated media at the University of Technology in Sydney and at just an uh, assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon University and a Paul Rudolph visiting assistant professor of architecture in Auburn University. Uh, he's the co-founder of um, uh, interdisciplinary research called the Fiction Feeling Frame Collective. I'm really happy and excited uh, to have four of you all with us, and I'm very much looking forward to each individual presentation and discussion afterwards. So with uh, no further delay, perhaps we can start with Nazgul. Uh, if, if I may just add a few words uh, for the audience that are joining us from different places, um, I think the pres individual presentation will last something between 30 to 35 minutes. We will leave uh, around 10 minutes for direct Q&A if there is anything to be discussed about the projects with the, with the artist uh, and the presenter. And at the end, we will have uh, almost a full hour of discussion around virtual roundtable uh, between you and the artist and moderated by, by David Burns. Of course, we will have coffee breaks as well. <laughs> okay, uh, Nazgul, the virtual floor is yours if you want to share your screen. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be joining the symposium from Tehran today. Um, okay, so... You see my screen? Fine. Yeah. We see uh, the, the uh, columns of small thumbnails on the left, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. If, if you can tolerate them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, Hamid already um, gave a little introduction, but um, to give you a, a background for those of you who are um, not familiar with my practice, my formal education was in design. I studied graphic and media design at London College of Communications and received my MFA in design from CCA in San Francisco. Uh, it was during my graduate years that I realized I no longer want to pursue a career in design. And although I worked as a designer for a few years uh, after graduation um, uh, and even taught at um, um, uh, Tehran University for a, a short 
uh, while. I was looking for ways to disassociate myself from the field. But interestingly enough, 15 years later, the visual language and the practice I've developed has its basis in design. Uh, and I work and think more or less in the same method that I was taught. Uh, apart from my method of uh, practice, what binds my projects together are their subject matters, as they all tend to come from my immediate surroundings. I've therefore um, been a keen observer of Tehran and have explored various aspects of the city through my work for the past 15 years. Through my work, I intend to draw relationships between everyday life and its wider social, political, and economic context. This city, and in um, my case, Tehran, is not only a backdrop of these relations, but it um, plays a role in their shaping. In the process of analyze, uh, anal analyzing the everyday in its context, I've consequently captured the changes of the city and sometimes these changes have become the main subject of my project. Today, I'm going to share with you four projects dating between 2011 and 2020. Tehran has been going uh, through a fast pace of changes, which are hard to ignore when you are uh, when you hear the sound of sledgehammers uh, demolishing neighboring, a neighboring house all day and the sound of metal crashing as trucks unload metal beams during night for new constructions. Around 2014, I started to phot photograph what was left after opening up space for new construction. Stuck to the adjacent buildings, uh, often one or two walls of the demolished buildings would be standing after everything else was gone. Uh, these remaining walls uh, put on display what were once bedrooms, bathroom, kitchens, and family rooms. Containing the last bits of memory of lived space, the life of these walls were also short-lived as they would be soon be covered with new construction. And I thought if the, if the temporary surviving walls were somehow preserved, the attached fragments of memory would perhaps allow for the recollection and recovering of the entirety of the lost house. And that is what I intended to do, to pull the skin off one of these walls and to preserve this fragile layer. I started by doing some drawings from the photographs while looking for ways of documenting the layer as accurately as possible. The first thing that came to my mind was casting it. Um, but in Tehran, pretty much any activity out of normal range in um, the public is not allowed or is looked uh, um, at with uh, suspicious. Uh, so casting the wall was out of question. Through my research, I came across uh, 3D um, uh, I came to find out and learn a little bit about 3D scanning, which at a time was a relatively new technology. And after much wandering around the city, I was very lucky to find this demolished house, um, which um, in a way was a perfect architectural cross-section and contained all the most important parts of a house. Um, it had spaces that looked like a living room, a bathroom, a kitchen, uh, as well as a staircase. So this is how the scan came out. The scan was made of uh, over 6 million point points, and it was the thinnest representation of the surface of the wall and all the traces of the lived life. Um, but the challenge was now to turn the points into a surface and to turn the surface into the thinnest layer possible. Um, based on the data, um, 
from the scan, um, I had um, a, the, a styrofoam mold uh, made using CNC milling technology, and I started to apply all sorts of casting material, including silicon on the mold. The samples you see on the right um, photo are some of the materials I laid on the test mold um, to find something that had a skin-like quality. And none of them worked um, as the material I was looking for had to be fragile looking, but sturdy enough to be applied uh, onto a 25 square meter surface. It had to um, keep its own weight uh, while being hung. Um, so after many trial, trials, I finally um, reached a recipe for a paper paste and a method of laying it on the mold. And this is how the, the test came out, which was I was quite happy with. Um, this handmade paper took the shape of the wall, but it was um, thin enough to even let the light go through it. Um, and this is how um, the molds um, slowly get uh, covered by this paper paste. Um, it's a very slow process. Each section of the wall takes about four to um, three to four weeks to be covered. And once the paste would dry, it would, um, I could pull it off like a skin. And this skin was a one-to-one -one positive cast of the wall. And this is the work uh, membrane as it was installed um, at Green Art Gallery. You can see it from the side and um, see the thinness of it. And this was uh, last year at Argo Factory. But apart from the three dimensional transformation of the city, there has been things that have been changing into two dimensions. Surfaces of buildings um, that have been used as white canvases ever since the revolution of 1979, and especially after Iran Iraq war have been used by the municipality for painting murals and writing calligraphic slogans. These murals have been changing every few years, projecting the socio-political situation of their time, registering the changes through eight years of war onto the era of economic and industrial development, to the era of cultural and social openness, and finally to the Iran of today. Around 2011, the municipality of Tehran slowly changed the face of the city yet another time by replacing some of the older murals with new colorful imagery of nature, Iranian countryside and traditional architecture. Uh, as the city was losing more and more of its open spaces, murals of gardens with blue skies, um, old Iranian architecture with their nostalgic air created illusions of openness. Um, ideal scenes from the countryside or customs of the past covered our modern and actual urban life, projecting a supposedly desired onto the undesired. So walking in Tehran, one could find a Kashan style house with a courtyard painted on a, one side of a three-story building from the 80s, or a Yaz style architecture depicted on the side of a newly built apartment complex, or rows and rows of painted adobe villages on the side of um, highways. Most of these large scale paintings also played with perspective and uh, the already existing architectural elements of the buildings onto which they were painted on, suggesting uh, emerging of the real and the unreal architectural structures. So the, the project Fabrications, which is a collaboration between me and architect Ruzbe Elias Azar, takes these murals and the buildings that they're painted on um, as its subject, turning them into miniature monuments. The project actualizes and gives some form of reality to the painted spaces by making the two-dimensional, three-dimensional. Um, during this process, we try to stay as true as possible to the, to the painting, to the murals. But in order um, to translate the painting into architecture, we worked out some of the details based on the architecture of the region each uh, mural was re uh, referencing. Also, some of the murals um, 
paint uh, were painted with incorrect perspective and that was also incorporated into the design. So after figuring out how these two um, spaces would merge, uh, the drawings were translated to simple architectural models. And, and once finalized, they were modeled um, in 3D. And later um, printed in 3D. Using 3D printing was an essential uh, to the concept of the project as it would allow for a like, creation of a jointless object um, where you couldn't tell where one building starts and the other one ends. So here are some of the other examples. We work on a total of um, five uh, murals. So when both buildings, the actual and the fictional, are mer merged into a, an um, architectural model, the real and the unreal are given the same amount of importance and uh, the same circumstances to fight uh, for existence. The process of merging of the two creates uh, opportunities for such decisions as to how each building occupies its own space whilst interrupting the independence, values, and functions of the other. And while each era has produced its own specific architecture reflecting the ethics of its ruling power, this project attempts to capture the ephemeral nature of these murals and frees them to become the representatives of their own era. As the municipality is compensating for the loss of space by painting these murals, it is also profiting uh, on issuing various permits and occupancy certificates, playing the role of a catalyst in the construction frenzy. With its rising structures and the overall growing height of its dwellings, Tehran at the first glance appears to be in a process of construction. Um, and what is less noticed is the processes which open up space for these dwellings. As uh, touched up upon in the project membrane, most of these new buildings are filling um, the space of what was there before, and they're contained within their existence, the annihilation of the existence existed. But um, going a step further, one can say that despite the stone-covered, built-to-last look of these new buildings, they are part of a larger cycle of accumulation and obliteration. Demolishing buildings buying waste, um, which I used as the title of uh, my project, was a phrase spray-painted on the walls of low-rise buildings in Tehran, which is the, which is, the phrase that you can see in the image that I have now. This phrase, together with the accompanied phone number, was the sign of the force that had been transforming Tehran in the past decades. The fast pace of demolition, which on average takes two weeks for a 200 square meters um, uh, uh, for like a, a three-story building, quickly erases the physical features of the city, while the gradual process of building gets our eyes slowly used to the uh, new spatial forms. By the time a building is finished, we can no longer remember what it, uh, it was like before it existed. And this is um, how Tehran has been harshly but methodically changing. Since the demolition happens behind closed doors, and in this case, the front facade of the building, I thought that in order to understand the mechanisms of this cycle, the first step of this project was to see how it's done. So although there was no um, shortage of demolition sites, it took me a couple of months to find a location that would allow me to be um, inside these buildings. Um, and this was not based on the danger inherent in the process, but because the site managers were um, skeptical of my presence with the video camera, as some illegal activities um, take place during this process. 
So when I finally find, found a site that would allow me to be present, over um, the course of 16 days, I documented in film and uh, photographs a complete process of demolition of a 30-year-old residential building. Uh, and in Iran, the whole process of demolition is done manually. Um, and um, the first hand witnessing of turning a livable space into piles of dust and rubble, uh, uh, rubble by um, sheer force of hand and sledgehammers uh, was a truly moving experience. Uh, this observation also revealed how and uh, what this building was made of. I became witness to what is called reverse engineering uh, in industrial design terms. Uh, the process of taking an object apart in order to understand how it was made. So based on my documentation, I redrew the demolished building in 3D using tools of architecture became my method of investigating demolition instead of construction. And coming back to the main question of the project, which was whether the city was under construction or in destru destruction, um, I wanted to capture a moment in the cycle which its direction was unclear. I was interested in the relationship between building material and rubble and the moment when the first becomes the last. So by going back to the moments in the video that uh, videos I had captured on site, um, this documentation became a way of studying details, um, the details of the process. And I started to demolish the structure of the building I had uh, drawn virtually based on the techniques I had seen used by the workers. I simulated uh, the demolition by applying force and gravity using computer software. I then um, moved to smaller elements um, of the building like ceramic blocks, uh, redrawing them in their standard sizes, uh, breaking them using the same method. And this would allow for a slow motion study of their fragmentation. So this piece, which is titled The Breaking of a Ceramic Brick, is essentially a couple of um, uh, seconds of frozen time turning um, a building block into rubble. And once all the building materials were virtually broken down, I set up a homemade production line for the fabrication of these uh, new fragments. In a way, these fragments became the standardized units of destruction and put together, they made up fake piles of rubble. Um, and, here, um, and here it is how they were finally displayed as the installation titled The Mechanisms of Growth. And as you can see in detailed shots of the installation, the pieces are displayed as specimen or, um, or as excavated pieces from an archeological site waiting to be reorganized and put back together. And in fact, it's uh, possible to do so since there are no physical breaking in the creation of these fragments. There are also no missing parts and everything can be put back together, bringing the process into a full cycle of making and unmaking. And um, in my most recent project, Pulsum Void, uh, Voids, I'm looking uh, this time not at a change, but at a, at a status of stillness. Um, I'm still looking at a spatial battle tied to the social and political currents of our time, um, but it is this time, it's not symbolized in the newly erected structures, but it can be found in the existence of persistent voids the empty pools of Tehran. While viewing one of the middle-class neighborhoods like Jordan from a high up position, the number of uh, empty uh, swimming pools is noteworthy. 
And in fact, if a pool is visible, it is li more likely for it to be empty and a better chance of it being full if it's hidden from a view. When in um, the late 60s, the master plan of Tehran was being modeled by Victor Gurin Associates after American cities like Los Angeles, the Iranian middle class shared some aspirations with its American counterparts, some of which manifestations can be found in architectural form. Um, LA as a desert city has 1 million private pools and Tehran with its long and hot summer days had the right climate for such facility. The domestication of water in the Iranian context, however, has a long history as the presence of pools or a shallow pool was an inseparable part of Iranian architecture. For centuries, Iranians have centered their houses and gardens around these shallow pools, both as a symbolic and functional feature. These shallow pools are not meant to be used uh, for bathing or swimming and served as decoration or for washing purposes. And it was only with the growth of modern lifestyle in the, in the 50s and 60s that the hose became um, a swimming pool. The revolutionary culture of post-1979 affected many aspects of space by advocating for the religious over um, the secular values and tradition of, uh, over modern lifestyle. And endorsing this culture on individual level meant that the private um, swimming pools were subject to voyeurism and their use seen as a potential threat to the new public morale. While the reinforcement of these sentiments explains uh, why the pools remain empty during the hot summers of Tehran, but it doesn't answer why most of these pools continue to exist after 42 years and have not been filled with earth um, and covered into parking or green spaces. Um, in a city where every inch is being built up, what does it mean to have these voids remain intact? Um, perhaps like any other object that one doesn't use, but keeps in the hope of using in future, the maintenance of the empty swimming pools follows the same logic. Keeping these voids not only expresses a wish for, for, wish for them to be filled and um, used in an unforeseen future, but holds um, to the memory of them once full. So looking at Jordan as one of Tehran's neighborhoods, according to the municipality records, in an area of three square kilometers, 1,100 shapes are labeled as private waters, representing swimming and de decorative pools. And when extracting the pools and bringing them all together, the totality of these negative spaces creates a space the size of a lake. This large container, whether empty or full, highlights a collective desire for the presence of water. And while longing for water in our dry lands is not an unanticipated rediscovery, but the connection between water and the flow of uh, and and the flow and working of imagination is perhaps the less observed but strong aspect in the case of the maintenance of these empty containers of water, showing that a mass water in one way or another um, has been an important part of Iranian collective memory and aspirations. My investigation of these persistent voids pushed me more and more towards the latent collective longing underneath the individual appearance and gave direction to my formal experimentation. Looking for new possibilities um, that the integration of these negative spaces creates, I took the forms from the municipality records, giving them depth and dimension, connecting and combining them through a liquid material. When connected, the pools once again allow for the possibility of movement and flow, and they attempt to create an image of a streaming water, as opposed to the image of the stagnant waters accumulated in the bottom of empty pools of Tehran. 
And I like to finish this talk today with um, some of the finished um, final pieces um, of this project, um, which are currently on display at uh, Gallery Raffaella Cortesi in Milan. Um, so these images are from a series called Connected Pools. And the last one is um, a series called uh, Private Waters. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nasco. It's amazing. Yeah. Amazing sets of projects. Thanks. I'm trying to find a button to stop sharing my screen, but Should I, can't, be... I can't find it. <laughs> Yeah, you're right, but it should be in the middle, in the lower bar. Yeah, but the, the whole thing is actually, oh, there it is, it's on my second screen. Okay. And perfect timing as well. I'm impressed. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, it's a start, but let's see how it goes. Okay. Um, I mean, we have uh, we have a couple of minutes here to, to reflect, or if there is any question regard, since we are now freshly filled with this amount of imagination and images and information about these projects, probably we can, uh, there is a chance of asking Nazgul questions about them. If, if anybody from the public or speakers uh, wishes to open up a discussion. I mean, I was personally very intrigued by, by a point that you made, Nazgul, about in, in the second project, Fabrication, if I'm not wrong, uh, where you made a note very subtly about, uh, let's say, using technique of 3D printing as, as a technique that merges uh, reality uh, with the imagined one or with the projected one. So it's, in a way, the grain of uh, the filament is an, is an important agent here. Uh, mm. for, uh, let's say, not only the conceptualization, not only the realization of the project, but also the conceptualization of the project. So I wonder if, if uh, such a thing in, in terms of, let's say, techniques that you use and you choose in different projects has mm -hmm. been developing as, as part of the thinking of, of uh, and the research part of the project as well, like the one that you pointed out, or, and if you can elaborate a bit on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, as you probably saw in the example of four projects, they, I use um, quite, a, you can say, a, a, a big variety of, of uh, media. I, um, I didn't share any of the videos, but I um, sometimes use video whenever there is need for, um, let's say, time or movement. Um, I always change my, I never know what um, the final outcome is going to be when I start a project. It's um, um, the projects are usually long term and they involve a lot of experimentation with various um, materials in order to reach the, um, the quality that I have um, in my head. Um, so again, like membrane was a, was a good example where I tested with so many various uh, materials in order to reach the, the sort of the texture, the thinness, um, and also the, the, the sort of fragility, and at the same time, the, the sturdiness that I needed. Um, so as you mentioned, um, in fabrications, it's actually one of the projects where there is no um, involvement of hand. So it goes, uh, and that's that's one of the, the the qualities that interested me in the three D printing, um, where you imagine something, you draw it on the computer, and it goes, it sort of suddenly comes into being without the, your involvement, uh, without touching it. So maybe when you say the the pigment. Um, 
becomes an uh, an element of imagination, I think that's a very good description. I, my idea was to to be uh, to have the shortest route from um, imagining something, um, an image uh, or a space, and to suddenly have it in in reality. Uh, I, I actually. Mm. As a technical issue, I just realized that, of course, that the crowd cannot unmute themselves. That's why nobody asks questions. Uh, so oh. uh, we are we are using in our chat uh, uh, to 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 write down the questions, and therefore uh, I can read them to you, Nasbo. Uh, we have a question uh, from uh, Fatemeh. Uh, Hi there, a great set of work. Thanks for presenting them. Uh, for your first set of work that uh, you presented, could you please elaborate on the choice of the paper, like its lightness or the weight, to, pre to preserve uh, each fragments of the build? So how the material comes into play in that? Yeah, I think I, I, I already a little bit talked about that. Um, I realized that paper, while it's very fragile, it's also a very sturdy material. Um, so, this is this is um, you know I, I came to using it uh, by experimenting with various media and um, to reach the quality that I was looking for. Nothing had, um, let's say, like silicon. Um, you probably can't um, hang a twenty-five square meter silicon um, sort of wall. It would just like. Um, fall down so yeah i i it, it just it it wasn't that i had an idea of using paper i just applied as many weird things as you can imagine on the surface on the surface on the mold and i finally arrived at um using paper great i mean it could be also translated i mean uh, what you said and also into, again, I try to use this word quite a lot, uh, agency. Um, so the agency of resolution here in, in the wider sense. So resolution in your work can be translated probably in the grain size in Alessandra's work uh, uh, that uh, comes after, or I don't know, paper, photographic paper grain, or even screen resolution in uh, uh, David's and uh, Miles' work. So in a way there is a, a kind of common thread uh, that uh, a property, a very subtle property like resolution, which we usually face it as given or as found, uh, it could be, uh, let's say, the medium through which an idea can be developed, not only that, but also represented. Mm -hmm. If um, do we have any other questions from the crowd? If we can use the chats uh, section more uh, actively for communication, and I would be glad to read out the question and comments to our speakers. I think at, at the end, we can also open it up for common uh, and group discussion. Uh, there is another question from Miguel. Uh, fantastic work. The ideas behind each project are so clear and powerful. I wonder if Nazgul could expand on her focus on experimentation, how she reflects on what is coming up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I, I gave a, 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 at the beginning a little introduction on how my um, background in design, uh, education in design um, has led me to work in the way that I do um, right now. So experimentation, formal exper experimentation was the basis of my um, education in a way. As a designer, um, we were very much encouraged to, um, once we have our subject, to investigate um, the subject both formally and let's say um, to do both a visual and a theoretical um, investigation on the subject. Um, so this is, it's just um, a way uh, for me to, um, let's say to, to warm up or to sort of to get to know my subject. Um, I, I usually start with, um, 
taking the elements of that subject apart, breaking it down to uh, smaller elements and um, do some formal experimentations with them um, in order to understand the, the, let's say the mechanisms of their working. And then um, throughout these experimentation, I start to uh, in a way re, some, sometimes reorganize some of the elements and put them back together and this is how the new work comes out. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess this is this. It's my method of of working. Um, a lot of often, I um, there are parts of the project or um, some of formal experimentations that I never use or it's never seen at the in the final result, results, but they have led me uh, to get to, um, to get to the final work. There is another question by Tabitha. Uh, uh, thank you for fascinating talk. Was there any specific significance for uh, the material used for representing the walls uh, for the membrane project being skin-like? Mm -hmm. um, so, what I'm talking about in membrane is the the traces that are left on the the walls, the traces of um, life. Um, so, in, in a way, in order to um, to speak about or to preserve those uh, memories, it is it was just enough to preserve that thin layer that held the the traces of life. Um, almost like the scars that you may have on your skin. Um, so this is um, already what I was faced uh, with, you know, when all the other walls were demolished, I was already um, left um, with a wall, with a thin layer. And I thought that in order to preserve that, uh, the traces of that lived life, it's just enough to pull off the, the first layer. Um, and uh, this is how the idea of skin or membrane came about. Um, there, there is uh, another question by Darian. Um, that, thank you, Nazgul. I was intrigued by your second project and the fact that the government uses blind facades as a medium uh, to propagate uh, and compensate certain desires. Could you elaborate if uh, there is an... Um, opposite movement to, uh, to this top-down medium, like graffiti, posters, flyers, etc., within the public realm, and what impact does this have on your work? Mm -hmm. what's, what's the struggle on the walls, basically? There is a little bit of, you can say, um, graffiti, uh, let's say movement, but it's quite, um, I would say it's not a very, even if it's happening, it's at um, uh, not at, it's at a very small scale. And by scale, I really mean scale. I mean, if the, um, if the murals cover up a, a three story building and um, you see, um, uh, let's say these uh, scenes of nature or the image of the, the martyrs um, in such scale, the graffitis happen on low, uh, in like, let's say in back alleys. Um, but I would say perhaps the more um, visible, um, I wouldn't, I don't know if it's a movement or not, but um, in, you see a lot of um, traces, almost like a little explosions that happened uh, during, um, uh, we have a, a ceremony just before the, at the end of the year, Persian New Year, where there's a lot of fireworks and uh, young people make their own little, like, I mean, bombs. <laughs> and often these bombs are, you see quite a lot that they're thrown at these blank walls. So perhaps that is the most visible um, form of um, uh, how do you say it? 
dissent, <laughs> perhaps. Um, I, I think more than graffiti, that's probably more visible. Um, there is a, a kind of a new, a, a final note uh, from MT, amazing work. I was wondering if there was a specific system in the way that you decided to link the bodies of water in the final project. So the mm -hmm. composition of the weights, basically. Yeah. Um, no, I wouldn't say it was a, a system. It was much more, um, let's say, a formal decision. Um, what I wanted to do was to create um, shapes that, um, first of all, they were mixing both the shallow pools, as I was saying, holes, and the, the swimming pools together. And that the forms would create some kind of idea of movement or flow. Um, so this was, you can say very much uh, a, a, like a design decision um, when I was putting the, the pools together um, in order to, to, to create a space that you can imagine going from one to the other or swimming in from one to the other. And a question from uh, Nargis. Thanks, Nazgul. That was really great. Following one from Hamid's earlier point on 3D printing, having uh, the quality of collapsing the gap between the imagination and actualization in fabrications. Uh, this seems to be uh, in contrast to your project Membrane, where you said every section took three or four weeks to complete. I wonder if you could reflect on different processes and how they were informed by the ideas behind the projects? I think I already explained a little bit um, um, about the process of working. Um, but just to, just a, like a little note, um, all of the projects in a way have a combination of use of technology and um, also a labor intensive uh, aspect in them. So it's a combination of both. I, whenever technology can come into the aid of something to facilitate its making, um, I use that. But whenever there is a need of um, hand or intricate work that can only be done by hand or actually the imperfections that hand creates and it's necessary for the project, um, then it becomes, you know, it, it's always the, uh, the sort of image or what I've imagined in my head that um, defines what, uh, let's say technology or what technique or what material I use to arrive at um, the, the, the image that I think is right for talking about the subject. Uh, amazing, I have also good news that you can now raise your hand and I can unmute you to ask your own questions. So if, if uh, there is a reactions uh, bottom uh, at the bottom bar of your Zoom uh, interface and there is a kind of raise hand uh, option. Once you do that, whomever wants to ask question or speak, uh, if you do that, I can immediately recognize you and unmute you. Perfect. I'm sorry for this technological uh, power relations. Okay. Um, shall we move to Alessandra's? If you're, if you're ready, Alessandra. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Nazgul. We will talk more about it uh, during the discussion. Um, one second. Okay, can you see my yes, screen? Perfect. perfect, thank you. Great. So, uh, thank you so much for inviting me today. Like, I'm very happy to be part of this. Uh, Symposium, and uh, so uh, and thank you for the introduction also before. 
So as Amel was saying, I'm Alessandra and I'm founder of uh, sort of Sidiana, uh, which is a practice in architecture, design and research. And we are based in Rotterdam. And um, I, it's uh, sort of edited together with Giovanni Bellotti. And uh, like in our studio, like we work across the different scales, uh, like from materials to objects, uh, installations, research project. Uh, um, and uh, today we'll first introduce a few themes that are relevant for us. Uh, and then present a few projects at different scales, uh, like some image and another, uh, um, uh, like realized. And uh, so, like something that we try to do in our projects uh, is uh, like to imagine and create uh, alternative worlds, uh, which we see like as a collection of fragments. I mean, to convey visions for the future, uh, and that could propose forms of relational encounters, uh, rituals, and activities. Uh. And uh, like we are interested in designing spaces uh, that ask for action and transformation, and uh, like that, that, that could be also could give a, like could be an invitation uh, to play and engage, and also spaces that tell stories and set narratives, uh, and, uh, and and we do this uh, like by working across different scales uh, like uh, both architecture, objects, uh, and materials, uh, and uh, like something that is uh, like quite central. Uh, in, uh, in our projects and in our method is uh, like really the work with materials. So like the translation of materials into architecture. And for us, this is uh, like always a point of departure in our project rather than uh, a layer that is added at the end of the process. And um, in our projects, we've been exploring different techniques and materials and uh, like mainly related with casting. And uh, we love the process of casting because it involves the different materials and the different expertises. So from the materials of the formwork uh, to the different minerals uh, for the aggregates uh, and the alchemy of the mixing and pouring of this kind of fluid material that becomes an artificial stone. It's something that we always love very much. And, and the materials also are for us uh, like a way to embed narratives and identity in spaces and objects. Um, there are also ways to tell stories, uh, emphasizing the bond of the, of the territory, for example. But, uh, and, uh, and now we're currently working on new materials, uh, which are based on horticultural composites, uh, like expanded clay, earth, hemp, uh, which are in a way cast soils so that could be garden and with time uh, become soil again. Uh, or what we call a surf and turf material. I will go through this uh, later on. And, and this, for example, is made by industrial soil and uh, like materials from the sea. So it's, it's combining uh, expanded clay and charcoal with shells and uh, like we see materials uh, like not only as samples but also as operative objects so are for us also powerful seduction tool that are often bringing the one-to-one -one scale in the conversation when everything is still abstract and imagined so at times the samples uh, like we explode them for compression tests at times are presented to the client uh, almost as a sort of a first stone of, of the project and um, I would like to start with uh, uh, like the first project done by like, done as a studio Sidiana, which is called Petrified Carpets, and uh, is an installation of concrete elements that is inspired by forms found in the Persian carpet and garden. And uh, it's a project that for us was uh, like a sort of guild manifesto, and they, that explored architecture through materiality and the translated narratives into forms. And uh, like the project started with. Uh, looking uh, at the carpet as an artifact that is both an object and a space. So it's a theminos, uh, which frames domestic and religious rituals, uh, like it uh, embodies craftsmanship and her storytelling. And we were also very fascinated by the process of uh, petrification of carpets into stones and ceramic, uh, and by the material transfer of textiles uh, into stones. And uh, the research uh, continued by focusing on a specific type of carpet, uh, like called uh, like uh, garden carpet, and by studying it, it became clear how the carpet uh, is also like a, a, a representation of, uh, of a garden and, uh, and also how certain motifs of the carpet abstract actually architectural elements of the garden. So the border of the carpet represents the wall of the garden, the medallion, the central for, for, uh, fountain, uh, the square at, at times like the, the represents the, the, the kiosk and the, 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 um, the platform in the pavilion and so on. And um, so like th this installation transposed in three dimension uh, uh, the, the elements of the carpet and garden. So in a way, the project is both a research on uh, forms and symbols, uh, but, but also a material research on the expressive potential of, potential of concrete, uh, uh, which, which we find that is a material that in the building industry is progressively lost its expressive potential. And the project was also like a collaboration with a hand precast concrete manufactory called the Hurks Prefabeton, based in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And uh, with them, uh, we experimented uh, with a different kind of different techniques uh, of casting, coloring, and texturing concrete. Uh, 
and uh, we produced uh, like many different samples to achieve the desired shade, shade of color and mixture that could better translate and express uh, the narrative of each object. Uh, so like in this project, uh, stones, minerals, mixtures, and colors were ways to represent symbolically uh, the forms found in the carpet uh, and, and gardens. And um, here you can see some images of the wall object, which we call Pyradeza, that abstracted the border of the carpet and the wall of Persian gardens. Uh, and uh, like the wall Pyradeza, which is also the etymology of Pyradeza, also refers to walled enclosure made by a sort of dough of rammed earth. So we cast this element in, in, in different layers uh, in, in, that, that, that form this kind of topographic line with greenish stones. Uh, and this is uh, the formwork. It was cast horizontally with bended metal, metal plates uh, between each color. Uh, and then we removed the, the metal plates at once and by, by, by vibrating concrete, the colors merged together. And uh, this element uh, uh, abstracted the canat, which is uh, uh, like a well and uh, that somehow like uh, at the end, like becomes petrified in the garden and becoming a fountain, and uh, also refers to the medallion of carpets um, that uh, sometimes represented black, um, and and uh, um, and also in the miniature often the water is represented black, uh, representing this kind of uh, dark mirror of water that reflects the sky, bringing paradise on earth. So, in, in, like uh, the object was cast in a form or made of uh, earth. Uh, with a liquid mixture of concrete, uh, and then it was polished, uh, and by becoming dark, it also became uh, reflective. And um, this object uh, is called uh, Mirab, and uh, takes the name from mosques altars, uh, and comes back in the typology, you know, typology of prayer rugs carpet, uh, and abstracts an opening towards the garden. And it's a sort of half grotto, half rug. Um, and one side is polished at the maximum. In fact, uh, it looks almost shiny. It seems like there is almost a sort of veneer on top. And the other side is quite rough, uh, as a grotto work by hand. And uh, like the last element is uh, an elevated platform that abstracts uh, like a carpet and the landscape uh, on which to sit and eat. And uh, like the top of this element is lightly sanded. Uh, so it's not as polished and shiny as a blue element, but it's a bit more rough and porous. Uh, and these one are some images of the formwork. Uh, so also like, and uh, also in this case, the, the bottom part is sculpted by hand uh, while the concrete was wet in the first hour of pouring. And um, like for us, this one was uh, like, uh, yeah, the first project we did in this way and wasn't quite an exciting project and collaboration uh, because it was uh, really a learning process both for us and for the makers uh, as we brought in our own techniques uh, that were fair up to sculpture or model making uh, like making molds out of earth uh, but and all this also influenced the working uh, method at the manufactory and this also taught us a lot about authorship and collaboration and also how authorship changes uh, in a project that it moves across different scales processes and artisans so from the drawing to the model to the finishing uh, and uh, I know how we can work on this. So it was a great lesson on working with others because uh, um, the pieces were not fully designed and left to be constructed, uh, rather came from uh, the collaboration, the intelligence and the sensibility of the people who made them with. And uh, then Petrified Carpets traveled quite a bit, uh, like from the Dutch Design Week in 2016 to Milano Salone del Mobile in 2017. Uh, and, and then it became in a way a sort of nomadic uh, garden, that, uh, like an expected discovery in the city or inhabiting a clearing like a hidden garden. And another project uh, I'd like to present is Coldorismos, and uh, is the result of a winning competition for an artwork uh, for uh, a new elementary school uh, in Flöten, close to Utrecht in the Netherlands. So we wanted to design an artwork that was not uh, only to look at, but uh, something to play with and interact with. And uh, so the playground is, is considered as this enfilado of walls with passages and openings. And, and with this project, we didn't want it to create a place, place uh, we wanted to design a place that doesn't dictate how to play, but that rather fosters children's imagination, like allowing for different possibilities of use. So where uh, the act of playing would not be dictated, but they can have something to invent. So we wanted to design the space for the possibilities of playing, for the children to invent stories and rules to do so. So it's this landscape at children height, it's a space to pass through and explore. Uh, and we wanted also the playground to be an open work made by these abstract forms so that it could uh, stimulate actions so through affordances. Uh, so it can be seen as a labyrinth, a place uh, to, to, to climb, to be crossed, uh, and, um, and with all these openings to pass through. So it also was designed at children's scale. So it has the dimension of a passage for an adult, but for a child is a room. And uh, while working on the project, uh, 
Svan and I imagined ourselves playing in the ground, discovering stones and plants half buried on, in the soil and hiding from the adults. And it was in Salda's tier. And we were, always, uh, we were always very surprised when we go back because we see every time uh, that uh, children invent new games uh, and we, they always find uh, new ways to appropriating and occupying uh, this, uh, this territory. And uh, uh, also, uh, we were like officially initially commissioned only for the artwork, which is the screen uh, element with, with empilado walls. But we uh, really pushed to also design other elements in the courtyard. We really wanted to avoid the common plastification and the use of ready-made objects uh, in the courtyard. Um, and so like this process also allowed us to rethink how the vocabulary of playing and of inventing games uh, could, be, could be reimagined and how it was also actually restricted and how we couldn't reach it. Um, so we designed also other elements, uh, like a concave sand pit, a tribune, uh, and this uh, uh, football field edge. And uh, like uh, for this project, we made an endless amount of models, uh, like from the very beginning of the process. Uh, and the first one was actually made as a small cast piece uh, that for us was a, a kind of scaleless, uh, so it was big enough to, to fit in the palm of a hand. So it was this kind of uh, like almost a sort, a sort of evocative object. And then uh, in the months of preparation, later on in the process, we also even started printing the walls one to one of understanding rust the scale of, 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 our, of our design. Um, and also in this case, like from the very beginning of the process, we developed material samples. Uh, and this time with Tomello, which is a, tome a terrazzo maker from Rotterdam with Italian origins. And, um, and of course, like working with them, I started introducing also new layers and scales to the work from textures of sand to mineral insertions. Uh, and each one, like each sample became a sort of small world in itself. And together we developed a special mix for the walls. Uh, um, each wall has a different uh, color in a gradient. And uh, like also in this case, the material samples were really important for us. We did them from the very beginning of the process uh, and we present them uh, at the client in the competition phase. Uh, so, and, and this, uh, like we always found that is always something incredible, pow incredibly powerful because we are presenting uh, uh, something uh, imaginative, but then these materials are really grounding uh, the, 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 the project somehow. So they are running the project while, when, when everything is still abstract. These are other materials uh, that developed during the process uh, and uh, like something that we always really love is to be present at the manufactory while casting. Um, and, uh, and this is uh, about the formwork and after pouring. Uh, and uh, what we really love about uh, uh, sorry, casting uh, is how it trans translates also across the different scales. Uh, so like also recipes, chemical reactions and techniques are almost identical uh, while working on the model and working on the larger pieces. And uh, the, the walls were also enriched by different textures, uh, like uh, Shani Terrazzo one, and, and, and um, these are actually compositions of stones that we made ourselves uh, in, in, in the manufactory. And, um, and, and this is an art, another technique that is called washed out, uh, that we really love. And um, so, like, as a formwork uh, in uh, the manufactory, like, were filled and the elements uh, were cast, uh, uh, the factory is slowly filled with this kind of enigmatic uh, man-made rocks uh, with crystals sparkling under the water of the polishing machines. And uh, so, I mean, going around the manufacturing and see all these elements taking over the production spaces uh, started immediately opening up in our imagination many possibilities. Uh, they started becoming almost as fragments of possible worlds. And I would like now to talk about another project, which is called uh, Idil. And the project is uh, realized in collaboration with the Dutch architect uh, Herman Berker uh, from Avent Architecture. And actually, he was uh, he designed uh, this this uh, this uh, the project uh, and then asked uh, us uh, to collaborate uh, on uh, the materialization of the project. So it was actually commissioned to design an artwork in the landscape of Resen in the Netherlands. And the idea behind the project was to make an enclosure that would recall the ruins of a castle that was supposedly present on the site in the past. And um, so we started imagining this structure as forms emerging from the soil um, where we created the conditions also to be taken over uh, by plants uh, and in a way become ruins uh, merging with the surrounding landscape. And uh, the project was built, uh, built in 2019. And uh, last summer we went back and it was uh, really impressive to see how many spontaneous plants uh, started taking over the artwork uh, and uh, the niches and craters of the different sizes started uh, also like uh, created new habitats for the spontaneous plants uh, and the seeds started inhabiting the seams between the blocks uh, and uh, like uh, temporary ponds of water started reflecting the sky after rain and um, again we worked with uh, uh, Tomello 
and uh, um, this time on the a system of compressed earth formwork and um, so we used uh, like the same technique of uh, uh, petrified carpets uh, cannot element uh, but uh, this time we had to make it we had the challenge that we had to make them vertical so we made this around the earth so vertical walls uh, um, uh, and then uh, like we almost sculpt them a, a bit before casting and then uh, like the bottom of the formwork which would be the top of the object uh, was uh, like seeded uh, somehow with a plug of earth uh, and sand and uh, and soil uh, to achieve uh, a quite uh, rough and porous uh, texture uh, on the top uh, on the top and we didn't want a terrazzo uh, because it would interfere if you would see stones uh, you would see there would be too many things going on with also the porosity so we just sanded it sanded this element slightly you could only see dots of sand um and now it's in resin and plants and moss are taking slowly over. And, um, and uh, somehow like this kind of terrazzo technique that actually comes from the word terra, which in Italian means uh, earth. Uh, yeah, like it comes back uh, you know, with other meanings in the project. And um, I wanted to show also another project called the Amsterdam Allegories. And uh, it's a project with which we won the Dutch Prix de Rome for architecture as Ahmed was mentioning. And uh, I would like to show this project uh, because it's both, uh, in a way, an image in the architecture, but it's also one-to-one -one for us, uh, where the models are also operative objects. And uh, Amsterdam Allegories, so it's a proposal for a new type of public space in 6-7 in Amsterdam, which is uh, located in Amsterdam North, just outside the central station over the large canal I. That's uh, the triangle that you see in the slide. And uh, like so, after studying the new developments in Amsterdam North, uh, we realized that uh, the vocabulary for its uh, future public space uh, seemed mainly made by bold icons, Polish boulevard, and waterfronts, uh, fancy harbor with historical ship. And uh, we often find that public space have a milder design, which will follow a vocabulary that is uh, like a similar in every everywhere in the world. And um, um, and uh, like the project uh, wanted to offer an alternative to this, an alternative to this uh, new developments of the city in the language of the new developments of the city. And uh, what we wanted to do was transforming 6-7 into a walled harbor uh, inhabited by 21 floating islands uh, that could uh, yeah, like uh, remain inside 6-7, but also travel across the city. And uh, so we wanted the project to be like a call for a new surreal and experimental public domain that could be rich in sensorial experiences and discoveries. Um, and and uh, the island were for us like built allegories. So each referred to narratives, forms, types, and natures found in the city in its expanded territory. So the port, the lake, the polders, the fields, and not only the, the Amsterdam of the canals as we all know it. And the idea was also that uh, the islands would be accessible only by boat, and we were seeing water as a democratic surface and an unknown territory for everybody, where there are no beaten paths that uh, could enhance encounters. And um, the island, uh, like more than uh, being defined by a program, uh, like our, we were seeing them as different words uh, that uh, offer many different possibilities of uses uh, and misuses. And as we began uh, to design, like to think and build these models, uh, uh, in our office, uh, each uh, island became a project in itself. Uh, so in a way, the project uh, was a process of composition of stories, uh, architectures, and ideas of nature uh, that, as we proceeded, uh, began to communicate between each other and to suggest new encounters. Uh, and uh, like we'll go now through like a few islands. Uh, so this is uh, the Shore Island. And uh, that for us was a tribute to the Dutch coast, um, a thought on the relation between the city and the territory, but also on the relation between leisure and fear. So it reflects both on coastal erosion and sea level rise, uh, but also wants to convey a certain optimism. So it's a vast sandpit uh, from which uh, roofs and chimney emerge, uh, inhabited by a crane. Uh, and uh, it's an island that can be dug, excavated, buried. Uh, um, so it's a sort of sand garden. And uh, this is uh, uh, a house for collective barbecues uh, made by a series of independent fireplace rooms. And uh, we were imagining this as a place to rest uh, in a warm room during winter or dry up after a summer storm. And this is a uh, my favorite island and uh, it is uh, a black mountain. And uh, like we were seeing this as a floating embassy of the coal peaks in the port downstream in, in Amsterdam and a site for barbecues and adventurous campfires. And here, for example, for this model, we use the same technique of casting in earth, uh, then uh, in uh, uh, carpets and uh, the idyll. But of course, here, the grains uh, start uh, um, yeah, like assuming a different significance. 
and um, certain islands were more, um, uh, so also a bit more literal. We discovered uh, this uh, Obelt bathhouse that used to be very close to 6 7, and we reinterpret them quite literally, but as a place where to swim together with other uh, species. Um, and uh, this is a garden for agricultural, spontaneous ornamental plants uh, inspired by the pleasure garden at uh, Lusthofen, as uh, the many sort of landscape in the north. Uh, and this is a floating aviary. Um, and uh, through those, we started imagining Six Haven as a place of smells, uh, so a place where the smell of earth and fermenting cereals would mix uh, with the fumes of the barbecues, uh, while uh, wedding birds, uh, fish along humans and other animals short the shore with locals and tourists. And uh, like we thought of the islands as places where, at the very least, uh, different social groups uh, could cross paths, uh, share space, uh, but also as places where Amsterdam citizens meet other species, a place to cultivate a more nuanced relation with nature. And uh, where to, like, uh, Amsterdam citizens would meet, uh, like, embassies of the territory they inhabit, uh, or, like, elements of lost or forgotten elements of the city architecture. And besides being harbored in 6 7, the islands would also move uh, around the city, creating new unexpected. Uh, encounters with other figures of, uh, of the landscape. And uh, like with Amsterdam allegories, we wanted to imagine Six Seven as an intense rather than a dense space. So it was a celebration of the messiness of the shore over the sanitized slickness of the waterfront, the unpredictability of the encounter uh, over the vanity of the architectural statement. Uh, and uh, especially with Amsterdam allegories, uh, we imagine a space uh, where citizens would no longer be seen as users or consumers, uh, but as sailors, gardeners, farmers, collectors, uh, or explorers. And this was a project that was really important for us, both in terms of process, uh, themes, methods, and way of representation. In fact, it was the base for many projects that we are still doing now, like from the research method uh, and uh, like this analogy between forms uh, of the territory and architectural forms. Um, but also as uh, models, as uh, these uh, like operative objects so that could be both one-to-one -one and representation of both one-to-one -one objects and allegory of something else. And um, like strictly connected to Amsterdam allegories, I would like to show the fire tune, which uh, uh, is a project that came really like straight away after winning the Prix de Rome competition. And uh, it's also an example on how the, we developed uh, the method uh, uh, of Amsterdam allegories. Uh, so like this kind of imagined speculative project, uh, how this influenced uh, a project that uh, uh, finally is now built. So it was uh, supposed to open last year, but it was postponed to, uh, due to COVID uh, to this year. And actually the opening is now. So I'm going to give you a preview of, uh, uh, of the project. And, um, and it's also a project that received a series of iterations. So it was initially conceived for the beach of Almere, but is now realized in Utrecht. And uh, so in the horizontal landscape of the Netherlands, we started, uh, like we are really fascinated with these uh, heaps, uh, like from the dunes that protect the country, from the sea to the sand transported on the barges, uh, to the heaps of sand around construction sites. So it's this kind of landscape, it's something we're seeing emerging in many different places. Uh, and we start, started recognizing it almost as a type. And uh, like uh, we were asked by Raum, which is an art collective and association, to design a public space uh, and, and uh, that could co be connected to cooking. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, this is, uh, are some images uh, in their site last year ago, like, sorry, last year. And, uh, um, and when we visited the site two years ago, it was uh, like, a lands like a landscape of construction sand dunes. Uh, and what we really loved is that there were forms emerging uh, from this uh, sand dunes as this kind of chimneys of the factories, pitched roofs of new houses, uh, and also like children started appropriating them and playing with them. So we decided to, uh, to, to work with a team of cooking and especially with a team of fire and we started looking at fireplaces uh, and the different, different ways and different types of fires. So like from the fireplace as a collective opener ritual uh, to the domestic ritual as the earth of domestic life. Uh, so like in old houses, uh, the fireplace is almost a room in itself that, where you can almost sit inside. And then we have an ongoing fascination for, with the Russian stove. Apologies for calling it Russian. I'm aware that it belongs to many different cultures. And, uh, but still, we really love this object, uh, which is this, this uh, multifunctional um, object in the house that brings together stove, kitchen, and in winter become a warmer place to sleep. So this kind of huge object between architecture and furniture that radiates heat. So our uh, proposal uh, was uh, to, like so our project became a series of variations on the fireplace. Uh, so a room, a kitchen, a scenography, and a crater on the top with different orientation to 
protect from the wind, uh, that becomes a dune as it is covered in sand. Um, and for us, uh, it was a sort of Russian stove made of sand uh, that offers uh, different places that cook between the dunes uh, and a sort of scenography lit by the fire. And uh, as I was saying, we did a series of variations of the project, so from one large land fire dune to a landscape of dunes. And, uh, and we really love to work uh, on this type of models uh, where the material, uh, in, the, in this case, uh, sand and steel, uh, it's, uh, it's really one to be scalable. Um, and uh, so th these models also immediately become small worlds to explore. Uh, and we also took photos of the model by night, uh, like flickering, uh, like with the lights are flickering at different heights uh, in the night. Uh, and um, um, and uh, this is the main fire room in the model. And this is uh, the project uh, two nights ago when we lit the fires for the first time. And uh, we tried out the barbecue. And cooked. Yeah, I forgot to put the sounds away. And we also tested the oven with the pizzas. And uh, so with this project, we wanted uh, we tried to create a public space that could bring together the domestic intimate scale of the individual fire pit uh, with the civic a collective one of the bonfire. And, uh, and then these photos uh, like, uh, that you see here are uh, done by a very talented photographer called Riccardo De Vecchi, with whom we are collaborating. And we, we asked him to photograph uh, like both the objects and the process uh, of the installation. And these photos are quite important for us because they show architecture not as something fixed, but as something moving that can change shape and that has all these different phases. And, and the, on, on the construction side was uh, like a fantastic moment when we, we were really, it seemed we, working on, a mod, on the model one to one. So it had the same process and materials of our model, but of course larger with larger equipments and machines. And, and uh, what we loved is that many landscapes emerged during the construction site uh, as sand that was added or removed. Uh, and um, so walking around the construction site, the sand is so easy to move around, it really gave the idea of this landscape that could, could change and transform uh, any time. And uh, here there are the final touches. Sorry, I have some issues with the slide. Um, I don't know what's uh, exactly what, what's happening. This one was supposed to be a video. Anyway, uh, it was, uh, um, yeah, like it was really great that uh, also in this case, an installation was built with intelligence and expertise uh, uh, of uh, like a team we worked with. Uh, so like the steel makers and the dune master with the excavator that seemed moving uh, like the sand by hand. And, um, and this is how the project relates with the surrounding uh, communicating with the fumes of the distant chimneys. Uh. Uh, and also the dunes change shapes and texture. Uh, and uh, I mean, it just opened, uh, but uh, it's becoming one of our favorite projects, uh, as we see in this project and in the landscape, especially infinite possibilities uh, as uh, yeah, the dunes can be endlessly reshaped, revealing different textures, shells and minerals uh, in the different uh, like forms to emerge. Uh, and also being close to the fire in a urban setting is uh, in a new town. And, uh, and looking at the fire at night seems uh, like uh, immediately is transporting us elsewhere, uh, far away from the periphery of Utrecht. Uh, and we hope that uh, in this place, new rituals will, be, will emerge and that it will be transformed and appropriated uh, in many different ways. And uh, if I still have time, I have the last project. Um, maybe we'll just go. Yes, yes, if go it's too long, uh, I, I will no, stop. So um, the last project I would like to present today, it will be our first at least like closed building, which and we called it the Three Floating Rooms. And it's a competition we recently won and we are now working on. And it's for an art pavilion, which is a small, a small museum for land art and multimedia in Almere in the Netherlands. And it will open next March in Floriade, which is the largest horticultural expo in the world. And it takes place every 10 years in the Netherlands. And the master plan is designed by MBRTV. Maybe you, you, you know the project. Um, and uh, like first of all, uh, like uh, when we started working on the site, it was really important uh, to understand uh, the, to the context we worked in. Uh, Almere is a city in the Netherlands that was built in the 80s. Uh, it's a new town in Flevoland. And Flevoland is the 12th and latest province of the country. It is a result of the largest land reclamation project uh, worldwide. The territory that was open sea 
like uh, and uh, like uh, the main entrance in the golden age until uh, um, and uh, yeah it was basically the access to Amsterdam port and, and then Flevoland has been transformed over the 20th century into new land um, through like one of the largest engineering effort of the past centuries so islands became inland uh, sailors became farmers uh, and uh, the bottom of the sea became uh, a vast uh, mud, muddy landscape to explore and uh, so we were really fascinated by the story of Flavorland uh, and also how Floriade in this context uh, is part of this story and of his making. And uh, a bit as uh, with Amsterdam Allegories or other projects, uh, during the process we started looking at the figures of the landscape of Flavorland uh, and uh, like islands, uh, as I was saying, that became inland or new islands uh, enclosing uh, lakes of dredged silt uh, containing, containing new forms of nature. Uh, and uh, like. Uh, so we started looking at these uh, land art uh, projects uh, that are scattered around the Flavorland as a sort of uh, new means of foundations, uh, the new shores. Uh, and of course, uh, yeah, like uh, both Flavorland and Floriade spoke about cultivation, uh, both uh, the intimate scale of gardening, uh, but also the territorial scale of farming. Uh, and um, in this landscape of variations on the language of lightweight glass palaces emerged from the greenhouses uh, to, to glass palaces, crystal palaces. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, with this new nature, there are also new inhabitants of this place, not only human ones, it's also mineral and anim animals, which has, uh, have arrived and that uh, will come back in our research later on. And uh, so after these uh, uh, considerations, uh, we began to think of the museum as a sequence of characters, each working as a frame. So the first one is a port, which is a circle frame in waters, a disc to be created and cultivated where plants can be gardened and action performed. And the second one is a platform that would be the terrace of the museum that floats within the ring. And, um, and, and then the museum itself, the museum pavilion, that would be docked tangentially to the ring and that we envision with this uh, lightweight, as a lightweight uh, structure, like a floating greenhouse. And uh, so these one are the three main characters uh, that makes the museum. And for us, what was really important was to propose a new type of museum that could offer different possibilities uh, for creating exhibition and for cultivating water. So like, uh, yeah, it was very important uh, to, to, when we thought of the Museum of Land Art in Flavorland, it was really important to, to think at the relation with the water and how to exhibit uh, uh, and and uh, yeah, like not only let's say on land, but also uh, perform, interact, uh, display on water, uh, and how we envision this place as a port. So we started imagining different possi curatorial possibilities, um, from a water courtyard, almost as a bagno vignon in Italy, or uh, that where there could be collection of water plants, um, or floating treatment wetlands, uh, or uh, like uh, a place where people like boats could moor there. Uh, uh, following, for example, the exhibition spaces, and uh, maybe there could be houseboats uh, um, mooring, mooring there for art residencies uh, and uh, different ways of presenting artworks. Um, and this is uh, where the, the pavilion will be located. And uh, so the observatory itself, so the, the, little, the, the, the small museum, is very simple. Uh, like there is just a core with services, and then uh, the circulation is on the side to keep this kind of, uh, uh, to keep experiencing the infinite loop of the circle. And, um, and yeah, this, and here comes back what I mentioned at the beginning, what we call surf and turf uh, terrazzo, which is a material research that we developed specifically for the project during the competition phase. And, um, and that we're going to use as insertions uh, in the pier, in the pavilion, and in some furniture in the interior. And, um, and so we developed uh, for the project a collection of cast samples uh, where we use uh, masses and other shells, expanded clay, sand, charcoal, and an earth-based pigment that compose this uh, new material. So somehow petrifying materials from, from the region into this uh, new mineral floor. And um, so for the competition, we made samples of ourselves, uh, but then we started collaborating with Tomello again to scale it up to find the large quantities of shells and species that we can find in the Netherlands. And, uh, and these are some images of the process of uh, crushing shells uh, and uh, starting uh, like uh, seeing how to scale up the research. And, um, and now just a few images uh, of the latest development of the project. And of course, the representation started changing for us as soon as we um, started presenting not only to the jury, but also to developers, municipalities, and different parties. And um, yeah, like by night, we envisioned this, this, this volume, this facade that would emerge 
from the building, uh, creating a new civic facade. And uh, the walls are in uh, poly semi transparent polycarbonate and wrapped uh, by a curtain. Uh, so there will be different, uh, like light will filter in different ways for the polycarbonate through openings in the courtyard, uh, in the co uh, curtain, and, uh, and, and so on. And um, these are the competition images, uh, so the one that we love the most. So we uh, envision this pond as this kind of contemporary public lusto, inhabited by art, people, and other species within calmer waters, uh, and uh, a place where we could arrive by boat from the canal, uh, where we're to observe the sculptures uh, in, in the garden, or uh, uh, bathing within uh, this, uh, this uh, sculpture garden. Or if, uh, like in very cold winters, as uh, the past one, uh, the, the water might freeze, uh, becoming a skating ring. So the terrace could be shared by people and water birds, um, and the museum could be almost circumnavigated like a large buoy. And uh, at night, uh, it uh, will glow like a lantern, uh, revealing a glimpse of the digital art. Thank you. My presentation is over. Amazing work, Alessandra. Thanks. Thank you. I hope uh, everything is, was uh, clear. Of course. So, so I think we can also use this uh, blue hand raise or yellow hand raise option for questions. I might, I might jump in if I can. I'm, I'm going to save, I think, a lot of my thoughts for the end, for the moderation. But um, one thing that popped to my mind, and, and it's just a reference that I'm not sure if you know, but are you familiar with, uh, Alessandra, are you familiar with um, uh, plastiglomerate? Do you know what this, this term means? With it? No. Plastiglomerate? No. Plast oh, yeah, it's a, I'll, I'll type it in the chat window. It's, it's a... It's basically a material that's been proposed by a few people as um, in some ways kind of a representation of of climate change and, and discussions of the Anthropocene in which you have uh, happening now in, in certain parts of the world where man-made material and natural objects are fusing. Mm -hmm. So if you have a condition that has intense heat, so the floor of the seabed at a vent or perhaps on the beach where uh, people build fires, uh, you have a condition in which um, plastic mm -hmm. primarily starts to fuse with other materials. Mm -hmm. right? and, and if I know that like Heather Davis has done a lot of writing on this. Um, I think it was term, I think the term was phrased by, um, uh, it's, her name is, popped out of my head. Anyway, I think Kirsty Roberts, and I, I'll look it up. Anyway, yeah, I think it'd, really, know, yeah. it'd be really interesting, I think, for you to look at because a lot of these materials that you're that you're creating, they're referencing like terrazzo or other materials that maybe we're kind of familiar with, but then there is this sort of plastic nature and maybe it's not actual plastic, but there is a, a plastic nature to some of these things that you're proposing and materials that you're creating that have a kind of an, an extra layer, right? It's, it's not quite natural. It's not quite man-made. It's somewhere in the middle. Um, so I, I just thought I would put that reference in front of you if you hadn't, if you weren't familiar. Yeah. Um, I'd love to know more about it. Uh, and the, uh, um, um, I mean, for sure, like a certain kind of level of uh, like, uh, yeah, like plasticity or uh, this kind of, I mean, we are completely fascinated by this, uh, like a somehow man-made rock that brings together uh, um, like existing material and then the, it's assembling uh, like uh, them like all together. Um, um, so, no, I, I mean, I can totally, I mean, and also how we, like, in our process, I mean, we started first with, uh, uh, like, from uh, literally concrete mixtures and see how to reimagine them. And then uh, this started evolving also into something else. So, like, at the beginning of the presentation, I showed also the cast soils, uh, which is also embedding uh, different materials, like, uh, not only, like, expanded the clay, but also salt. Uh, now, for certain mixtures, we are also, like, uh, we are doing a series of projects uh, on the relations between humans and, and birds. Uh, and for the Venice Biennale, and we are like embedding in terrazzo squid bones uh, and other edible uh, materials, or materials that they used, were used to, 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 and supplies them extra calcium. 
So I would love to look uh, at this. Uh, yeah, I would love to look at these uh, references and uh, to the text that you mentioned. Uh, yeah, because it, it, also just the phrase "cash soil," like, yeah, it makes sense. We can imagine it, but there's also a perversity to that. That I feel like there's, it's, mm -hmm. there's, um, I don't know. There, the, we don't we don't imagine soil in a cast state, but of course we can imagine that because we're constantly forming the earth and we're constantly manipulating yeah. um, what it, we kind of imagine as being nature. But that sort of natural artificial that we create, of course it has a, a cast-like sense. But then of course with a casting, you typically imagine um, multiple ingredients allowing for a form, right? For a lot, not for a form, but allowing for a solid. Um, so yeah, I'm really struck by that phrase. It's quite a simple one, but at the same time, it, it triggers um, it triggers some interesting possibilities. A great, great presentation though. I loved it, yeah. Thank you. I mean, it would be great if you can share the, these names uh, and-, and the Yeah, yeah, I will. I'll send you a message for sure. Perfect. Uh, there are greetings and, and congratulations on the chat by Edward and Bea. And there's a question by uh, Fatima. Thank you, Alessandra, for your presentation. One common quality is noticeable throughout your projects, and that is the porous mineral texture, terrazzo-like. Was wondering if there is a reason behind the choice other than the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, no, thank you for your question. Um, for example, and I'm thinking, thinking at uh, Horismos. So we were asked to design an artwork that could be uh, extremely durable, uh, that with no maintenance. Uh, and uh, like we, I mean, in general, I mean, we were uh, like designing uh, like an artwork for a school immediately made, made us thinking at playgrounds and at also the work of Aldo Van Eyck. And uh, like what we really loved of, on, on his playgrounds it, it, it was that he was really using materials of the cities. Uh, um, and, uh, like, uh, and, uh, like, and, and then uh, and abstract forms uh, that would create uh, like uh, playgrounds for children. And, uh, and that one was a bit a starting point for us. Of course, ours are very different because uh, like, yeah, what we try to do is to reimagine uh, the material uh, as, uh, as uh, this kind of uh, precious and most jewelry-like pieces that would, uh, would sparkle off uh, um, in the city. So it's, um, I think uh, like we're working a lot with uh, with this material and we're really interested in uh, understanding and reimagining uh, the, the, these endless possibilities uh, um, and that we're really in love with the process uh, um, of casting and, and with the possibilities and its plasticity in a way um, and then uh, for example in in, uh, um, in in the like because you asked specifically about uh, the terrazzo and uh, like in the case of flavorland uh, it's a region that uh, really needs and wants to create its own uh, myth or history or uh, and and then for us was really like a way also to imagining a certain materials that could uh, could represent that that could represent that territory so in that case the terrazzo it's really like related to this kind of uh, yeah like creating this image of flavorland with its uh, the material and embedding them together in, in uh, for this public space and building I don't know if I this answered your question. Uh, I cannot tell. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> um, Artemi, I think you are you are unmuted. No, no, not yet. Thank yeah. you. Just a moment. I'll just start my video because I think it's more intimate to talk <laughs> in the camera to feel like you have an audience. Thank you so much for this presentation, amazing uh, spaces and objects. Um, I have a question regarding the Fire Dune um, project. Uh, I was thinking, actually my question is, is that a steel, right? The material is steel, naked steel. So I was thinking that uh, this material, like when we see it in objects, it can be um, heating up, like when we use it in the kitchen, etc. But in the scale of the building, it's usually, um, connected with uh, its cold uh, version. It's called, um, maybe this is really banal to say, like it's really cold material, but in this case, it's been activated by the fire. So it's kind of been hacked and 
bringing, it's actually starting bringing people together. I was wondering, does it become like really, really hot there <laughs> or how is it? Maybe it's really technical, but also it's like- no, I love this question actually. It's uh, yeah. also a metaphor because it brings people together by this mm -hmm. activation, both in the temperature uh, changing in the environment, but also through the practice of cooking. Yeah, well, this is a super good question. Actually, like we, with the contractor, we were trying to think at all possible ways uh, to not ma making it become super hot. And then we figured out uh, that actually the thick was uh, the, the, the steel work is done so well and it's so massive uh, that uh, it propagates heat, uh, but in a super nice way, like not burning. Uh, so you can touch this. I was really afraid that uh, while cooking, you would touch accidentally the steel and burn your hand. But that's absolutely, I mean, it's, it, it has a sort of very nice warmth uh, that it's not burning. Uh, and this, this is something completely surprising for, I mean, yeah, we, we didn't know what to expect. And uh, something that was also, it depends probably by the, how long, uh, I mean, Italy would love that a fire would go on there for all day long. And then maybe it will be different than only like three, four hours. Uh, uh, which is what we experienced. Our dream would be that, uh, yeah, this kind of, uh, yeah, that the sand will also become warm. So it will become this kind of, uh, almost as this, uh, yeah, Russian stone made of, uh, of, of sand and, and then you could, could sit in the sand being warm. Um, but indeed, uh, I mean, especially in this kind of, uh, I mean, now it's spring, but in the Netherlands it's still pretty cold. Uh, and, and for sure, uh, like uh, being around the fire, uh, like together and being this kind of warm and with the steel that is uh, gentle is like heating up. Uh, it's, uh, it's really, it's really inviting. And I guess, uh, um, I don't know, like uh, in the terms of uh, cam like people coming together, I was really surprised because uh, we were there two days ago and uh, there were already people like, that were trying to, were using it and cooking the pizzas. Um, and then immediately it became this place where we started uh, uh, talking to each other, meeting uh, strangers, uh, and and uh, talking about uh, food and pizza and uh, like many other things. So it's uh, and also people passing around, seeing all these fires lit at night. They were really like smiling or trying to understand what was coming up or trying to climb on the dunes and also enjoy the fire. So I really hope it would be actually a place that really brings people uh, like together. I mean, of course, with distance since, uh, but it's an open space. So it's going to be fine. So, yeah, sorry, I spun for like, I, I went in many different directions. Uh, I hope, uh, I hope there, I is, there is a question by Daniel uh, in the chat. Uh, thank you, Alessandra. I've been following your work for some, for some time now. I work as an independent artist based in Bogota. Uh, so my question comes from a heavy perception I have by doing this kind of very imaginative project in a very bureaucratic context. Uh, how do you relate uh, to institutions or how do you imagine this uh, that could be made by some non-cultural uh, entities? So in a way, very practical question about uh, your relationship with developers and manufacturer and all those mm -hmm. uh, artists involved, basically. Well, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, many of our projects, in fact, are with the cultural institution, but uh, um actually the, yeah the, the playground uh, for example uh, was not necessarily like i mean of course it was a cultural project but the client was a municipality of utrecht uh, and the school um and then actually it was pretty interesting because uh, it was uh, also there a very collaborative project process uh, with uh, the teacher the director of the school uh, this uh, board of, uh, uh, yeah, there is a board in the Netherlands that manages uh, the play equipment. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, I was uh, really amazed by how they gave me the commission like a few years ago. I mean, it, it's uh, when I didn't build anything and it still was a playground for children with liabilities and so on. And, um, and, and it was beautiful, the process of uh, collaborating. I mean, it was like there were parts of also, of course, difficult as well. But it was beautiful that uh, they really wanted to make this place better and they wanted to, and, and there was some kind of brainstorming together. So actually this kind of idea of uh, uh, having also waves for the football field that came during a discussion with them. And I was really impressed that that could happen in, in, a, in a situation when, I mean, it, we were not in the same, like in the same cultural background. We, were, we had completely different um, expertise, the background and, and, and so on. Um, and then for the fireplace, uh, that it's, uh, sorry, not the fireplace, the, the Almere, uh, Kunst Pavilion. 
that it's also a different story. So it's uh, we are also working with the municipality and uh, there is a huge team. We had a series of meetings with also developers that had uh, all their idea about, uh, yeah, like about the project process and the project. Um, and, uh, uh, and that it's, uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe to me, the difference between uh, uh, not really the bureaucracy, but there is really a difference when we are the clients. Uh, so we are seen as artists uh, or we are seen as architects. Uh, because when we are architects and there is a client, uh, then of course we have to do like the, like the client also takes decisions. Uh, and this is something that of course it's, it's, it's different than if uh, the client are, it's ourself uh, in terms of freedom and choices and, 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 and so on. Yeah, there's another question by Ploy in the chat. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation, Alessandra. I would like to know more of your thoughts on uh, color. How has color influenced your design methodology and how do you think it uh, has an impact on the spatial perception or context? Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that uh, yeah, like our work with the uh, color, I mean, it started all actually with the petrified carpets. Uh, uh, and uh, from there, and then uh, in that project was really about uh, um, creating analogies and relations with uh, uh, colors uh, that we were finding uh, in carpets, in the miniatures, in, uh, in, in architectures of gardens. And then from there, this one really started expanding our, uh, like, uh, yeah, like our uh, way of working with, with colors and materials. Uh, and it started coming back uh, in different projects. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I, I, would, I would almost say that uh, when we pick for a color or another one uh, is uh, almost, uh, I mean, we really look at what is the context uh, uh, we have around. So for example, uh, like in the playground, maybe it wasn't very visible, but there is a very red brick uh, facade behind. And then we really wanted to create something that could be complementary to it. Uh, or for the Kunst Pavilion, we wanted, uh, if we would have made something dark, it would not stand out in this kind of black dark with water uh, of, of the canal. So it's, uh, it's something that we, um, uh, like some, yeah, sometimes uh, it comes from the context. Uh, in other cases, uh, for example, in the cast soils, uh, some of the colors are actually given by the pigments that we use uh, in certain, we are, we are also, there are some tests and, and materials we are doing with uh, smells and curcuma and spices um, that also give the color uh, themselves. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think, or for example, also techniques that gives color, like when we cast in earth, uh, like uh, then, uh, like the, yeah, the soil, the grains of soil, of dark soil starts, uh, like it gets attached uh, and, 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 and bind uh, together with, with, with the cement, uh, and then this uh, gives a completely different shade of color than uh, if it would be um, cast, for example. Um, um, I cannot uh, stop thinking about uh, something you said, Alessandra, uh, while presenting. You said um, uh, the model uh, is is very instrumental for uh, for the development of the project. It's, it's, to, to some extent, it's a project itself. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would like to know more about uh, the multi-scalarity of the model itself. So probably, uh, I mean, I'm, I, I, would, I would like to know more, know more about it. I mean, a, a model cast out of a specific pigment which different with specific scales and dimension and the model itself representing something bigger than itself, but how you relate to it as a designer or as an artist to it, it is a one-to-one. -one. So. It's a, it's a very interesting, let's say, discussion to have somehow, also across four of you uh, as, as all the guests, but uh, in particular case that you discussed in uh, Amsterdam Allegory, perhaps, uh, how would you uh, talk about it? How, would you, how can you elaborate about uh, the instrumentality of the model? Were they models or were they the actual uh, projects? Yeah, I, uh, like indeed, I mean, for us, uh, like the models were uh, from the beginning, uh, they like we really wanted the models themselves to communicate uh, somehow and to speak to um, people that would see them. I mean, the idea was that uh, like all these models would have been exhibited uh, um, in an exhibition. It was also like, and we're also, yeah, like a little bit as material samples for us was, uh, yeah, it would have been seen by the jury and all this kind of field of model together.
would have to be like a sort of uh, each model a sort of conversation piece. So to us, uh, the models were immediately immediately thought as uh, also as one to one uh, and not necessarily as uh, as uh, I mean of course they were also like scale uh, like um, uh, in a scale uh, they were kind of a sort of a one to one hundred. Uh, Scale, but then it, it exploded uh, completely, and at the end, like also the scale itself, uh, we started uh, giving up uh, um, on that, really focusing on how to make uh, like the, the, the object itself as uh, most as expressive as possible. So, um, um, yeah, like there were like uh, yes, yeah, so, so there are different aspects. I mean, in a way, it was really like a tool for us uh, to design because uh, I mean we were sketching, but immediately we were also making. Uh, the models and casting these objects. Uh, and then we started composing them on this kind of uh, long table and started seeing how they would communicate to each other. Uh, and from there on, we would uh, uh, improve them, change them, uh, um, and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and then we were adding other materials. So for example, also in the sand, in the, in the shore island, the first one that I showed also, yeah, like there was this kind of process of casting, but there were also other materials like earth and sand uh, that were becoming like the protagonist. So there was always this kind of relation between uh, like, uh, yeah, something scalable or something one-to-one -one also in the materialization. There is, a, there is a call, also another question in the chat, which could be final for this session. Hi, Alessandra, uh, by, by Mamuna. Uh, hi, Alessandra, thank you for the inspiring presentation. I was wondering about the three floating rooms uh, how much uh, were you inspired uh, by Asian, Middle Eastern, or even Af African typologies of floating islands, where one or two houses are standing above the water like mangrove trees, or uh, where people traveling by water disconnected from the main routes or access points? So uh, are there references to uh, any, any other geographies? In, in That's a very interesting part. question. I mean, usually, like for many projects, we always look at uh, references from uh, uh, different cultures and, and, and uh, different places. Uh, but in, specifically in this case, I would be really curious to see these uh, typologies of floating islands, uh, because I'm actually not, uh, uh, not familiar with them. I mean, we've been looking a lot of, at, at the floating treatment wetlands and how those were also present in, in Mexico and, uh, um, and in other countries. Um, but I think there, like the forms were also really coming from uh, like the idea, like the circles, uh, about the idea on how circles belong to water right? and uh, like the, the veering space of a boat, uh, like maybe like a banally the drop or uh, uh, like this kind of uh, like water farms and so on. And then, uh, and the idea of uh, like somehow enclosing water into into this kind of uh, 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 like other world, uh, and uh, and and especially yeah, for in this project we were really really looking a lot uh, at uh, at Flavorland, uh, but uh, of course uh, like there are a lot of references that are in our mind that that, that uh, um, span from, from from many different cultures. I mean, we were also thinking at Bagno Vignoni in Italy, which is like the square of a village in Italy that is uh, actually like water, right? where people were also like bathing, or also the Soviet pool in Moscow, like this kind of gigantic uh, um, pool in, in the middle of the city that was uh, constructed on the foundation uh, of uh, like the Soviet palace that was never built. So there are like, for sure, there are a lot of references that are in our imaginary. And, um, and then they flow together uh, in, in, in the project. So, but I would love, I mean, if actually if you can share this, this uh, floating islands, uh, I would love to see. We love floating islands. So. Thanks a lot, Alessandra. I think at this point we can have a 10 minute break and then uh, coming back uh, with uh, Miles' presentation. Great. Yeah. See you in 10 minutes. Okay, uh, well, thank you. Um, Hamid for the very kind invitation to join today um, and to share the stage with Nezgol and Alessandra, David and yourself. Um, I guess what I'll do is attempt a, a sort of post-mortem on the nearly, I guess, decade of image making that I've been engaged in uh, in various channels of production. Um, and I, you know, like a lot of people, I think it's worth noting that in you know the eight years, I guess, that I spent 
between beginning an undergrad degree in architecture and graduating with an MARC. I don't think I ever really learned how to construct um, a building. And this is altogether you know, fairly common and maybe all the more so uh, given the programs I enrolled in. But as a result, um, the development of built works remains highly improvisational in the practice uh, common accounts that I run with Igor Brigado. Um, what I did learn though, uh, you know, was a capability with visual representational tools, uh, which largely, you know, I think satisfy the desire I have to materialize architectural speculation. Um, before Igor and I began working together at Princeton in 2015, uh, I had begun producing typological studies through visual speculative fiction in the spirit of future of the past architectural sci-fi. Um, and, you know, this work still continues alongside my work with Common Accounts. Um, and I'll share, you know, projects from both of these streams today. Um, I do think that the conceptual and aesthetic boundaries between the work I've produced independently and the image making project I advance with Igor and Common Accounts um, migrate as our priorities and preoccupations shift over the arc of our practices. Um, but a few procedures and media and methods are common to both. Uh, and in either channel of work, one can kind of identify a persistent concern to situate our discursive output by variously restaging and absorbing our precedents and references. Um, and so I'll prioritize that category of content as I unpack a few images here. Um, in a 2017 exhibition uh, titled Rare Item, uh, I produced an index of architectural technologies as a scaffold for pleasure gardens. Um, these are post-human environments in an exuberantly Anthropocene world. Um, in this series, which I presented at Corkin Gallery in Toronto, uh, I claim the attendant constituents of the built environment. So like signage, stanchions, stakes, ropes, piles, um, really is the critical architectural element. Um, the structural framework in each image sort of plays host to like a collapse of territorial properties in the same way that the naturalist tradition compresses a geographical expanse into a single garden or catalog. So these gardens work as arc-like vessels in the sense that they maybe contain a sample of the living world that feels adequately complete to one day repopulate some segment of it. Um, and to that end, they're available for the reproduction of uh, another world of accidental or renewed configuration. So architecture in these images is meant to be not merely kind of organizational, but also constitutive of the situations produced therein. So it's like a synthetic context where everything is constructed. And so the built environment is environment too. Um, for this series, a, a companion guide exists for each image uh, to document the naturalist imagery and botanical uh, illustration that populates each collage. The collages are, are constructed um, in Photoshop with digital tools. Um, I don't really rely on rendering for any of these works. It's all kind of like painted through really kind of rudimentary, um, almost kind of primitive, like, you know, digital brush techniques. Um, and all on a kind of touchpad or like, you know, with a mouse. Um, the, the, there is sometimes sampled material textures and, and in this case, the kind of floral illustrations uh, that come from these catalogs. Um, and, you know, so embedding in each image then you have this kind of index of hyperlinks to a deeper history of colonialism's destructive appetite for territorial analysis and ultimately modification and extraction. So in sampling this imagery, I look back in order to kind of attempt to look forward following the trajectory of the arc of human intervention in the natural milieu. So the work is preoccupied with the synthesis of the uncanny in the ordinary, consciously obviating the human body in all roles but viewership. Um, and to go one step further, uh, I later began to let content aware um, computer revisions modify the images, um, you know, so that the last hand to touch these might be non-human, um, though these really kind of remain studies rather than exhibited images. 
Um, and I printed a number of uh, these images and, and sort of images from the early days of, of my work um, in an eight and a half by 11 risograph zine called Rare World, uh, which was the second I'd made with Toronto's color code print shop. I was attracted to small batch riso printing um, because it was cheap uh, and gave, you know, these images a, a kind of renewed materiality and object quality that they were, I think, really kind of receptive to, almost, almost sort of longing for. Um, and a riso zine is, is so much more affordable than a framed print. So, you know, I could share these freely with friends. Uh, they could travel with me in the mail, all places really kind of easily. Um, and they also began turning up in unexpected places, maybe having been picked up at book fairs here and there, and then sort of resurfacing either online or at a distance. Um, you know, in years earlier, I'd begun making images for digital consumption, and it was really risograph printing that began to direct me toward the grain and texture that I later sought to reproduce in the inkjet prints that later hung in the gallery. So the book kind of came first and then, you know, gave me a clue as to how to, how to sort of uh, reproduce them at large. Um, and also in the painting of the frames, which you can see here are often speckled. The first scene that I made uh, was called Superlithin 7, and I'd had that printed in 2014 and brought it with me to the Venice Biennale where I was working at the time um, on the team for the Canadian Pavilion. I brought like 120 copies of the 200 I'd had printed, just kind of filling my carry-on suitcase with them. And then honestly just gave them out to friends and people I met who showed an interest. Um, and sort of, you know, funnily enough, one copy fell into the hands of a friend of my now gallerist, Jane Corkin. Um, and not long after returning to Toronto, we met and began plotting the first exhibition, um, which is also, when I really started, you know, first printing large um, digital editions of the images um, on the kind of physical. Uh, and that took about a year to get right, just in terms of technique and, and papers and, you know, all that. Um, but in preparing to think for today's event uh, about the role of image making in the scope of my work as a designer and as a visual artist, um, I sort of met with this like unshakable preoccupation with how I frame the instrumentality of the media I produce. Um, so in its most like superficial form, uh, that preoccupation tends to orbit around questions um, like, you know, is the image the sole product, the, the kind of lone descriptive artifact in a body of work or of an idea, or is it, you know, just one of many tools uh, working as part of a larger collection to approximate an idea's form, its organization, its operations, its attitude. Um, are these works mobilized in service of the image itself, like art, uh, or of a larger project, architecture, right? Um, and to which economies do they belong? Uh, or could they travel maybe freely across those commercial and discursive lines? Um, you know, a conversation like I had several years ago with a friend, uh, the curator uh, and historian Carson Chan, um, made me super conscious of an image's stability uh, as a possible indicator of its cultural function. Like did something I make offer raw experiential data, not over constrained maybe by its author and open to the possibility of interpretation um, and in that instability offer some valuable effect or did it transmit more finite information with deliberate intent, one-to-one -one, direct literal and so these questions, you know, honestly, I think they point to an insecurity born of two intellectual economies of visual production that are somewhat intolerant uh, of crossover, but that I, you know, often self-consciously kind of navigate in pursuit of a productive friction uh, with which to manage my output in each. Um, and increasingly, maybe there's less a separation, there's no identifiable each between, you know, the kind of artistic and, and the architectural um, in our work. Uh, but the nature of my work, both as a designer with Igor and Common Accounts, um, and the work I've otherwise produced as a lone visual artist, uh, belong less and less entirely to the formats um, and economies perhaps expected of our training in architecture. Uh, this may be a product of the desire to advance improbable ideas that could much more immediately live on the page or on the screen. Um, but in both channels, you know, however, 
uh, we're very much a product of our training. And the lens we have to engage the extra architectural is strictly architectural. Um, medium unspecific as we may be, uh, we can't altogether get away from the comfort we have with the intellectual and technical milieu that equipped us with the arsenal we produce with now. So Igor and I uh, pursued our master's degrees in architecture at Princeton, uh, where discourse is kind of inescapable uh, and where figures like Sylvia Levin, uh, Lucia Ale, Beatrice Colomina and Andres Hake were all invested in close readings of media and art artifacts um, and their political and economic context. And it was also an environment whose boundaries were kind of adequately malleable for us to stake out our project. Um, and where ultimately, you know, many others demonstrated uh, a kind of like abiding disinterest in architecture's exclusive penchant for building. Um, and in one of my first days there, uh, I, I sort of always remember this, Alejandro Zarapolo, who was dean at the time, um, and later became one of our thesis advisors, suggested I stop drawing with my right hand and pick up with my left, acknowledging, I think, that kind of stability with which I'd been drawing for the prior few years and that perhaps left more to be sort of explored. Um, before grad school, uh, you know, images I'd made tended to center a kind of clearly bounded form, often a building and landscape. Frames were square. Uh, which was really just to conform to the grid layout I maintained on a Tumblr at the time, which was the first venue where I shared this work. Um, and that too kind of reified the comfort of the content in just such a certain and like stable boundary. Um, and so a growing desire, I think, for like pictorial instability and conceptual complexity prompted me to move to closer croppings, uh, where form was not only uncertain, but maybe entirely indiscernible at the macro scale. And so these were no longer buildings necessarily, um, nor did they promise site. Uh, they were spatial situations. And this started to put greater pressure on the content that did populate each scene. And that's the context really in which the rare world pleasure gardens emerged. The first scenario images are where the scaffold organization began for me, um, albeit with like a very stable and rigid grid, uh, the familiar, uh, kind of robust material language of stone. Um, but as my practice with Igor developed, um, I began to translate some of the formlessness of our approach, uh, which is more about the collection of parts and situations rather than the, the like design of a discernible whole um, and attempted really to kind of sublimate the scaffold to prioritize situational content. Um, so this is around the time that Igor and I first began to develop work on death uh, and funereal technologies um, and self-design. So maybe unsurprisingly, instruments and tubing and the language of infrastructure began to enter my own images. Um, really, I think in an effort to atomize the representation of life to something more like life support, uh, constrained to apparatus in these decidedly post-human images. Um, and in, you know, my first works were concerned with a kind of Oniaric, dreamy past. Uh, these new images were concerned more with like the future. And I had a chance to expand on that. Um, and kind of the idea of looking like five seconds into the future uh, with a commission from Hamid um, and his colleagues, uh, Tane Habakin and Philippe Lefleur, for the extended program of the Dutch Pavilion at the 2018 Venice Biennale, um, where they had asked me to illustrate a pair of fiction. They had written in seven chapters concerned with the automated urbanism of the port of Rotterdam. Um, for this, I, I looked at the paintings of Jeffrey Smart, um, the queer Australian artist who uh, produced hauntingly vacant and, and really kind of beautiful descriptions of industrial urban fringe conditions in Italy, uh, where he lived from the 1960s onward. Uh, my mother is Australian. I had first seen his work when I was in Melbourne in 2013 visiting family. Um, I was totally struck, honestly, just by how contemporary his work felt um, and really kind of felt an immediate kinship uh, with him and the other worldliness of the scenes he depicted. Many of his paintings contain uh, like an implicit unease um, with the advancing boundary of the built world into the countryside. And so I wanted to capture that same unease um, and even make direct homage to his work 
to locate within the contemporary concern uh, with automation and posthumanism that the Port of Rotterdam project elicited um, and find in that an enduring universal concern with anthropogenic intervention in the world at large. And so Jeffrey Smart, um, as a guiding reference, also offered an entry point for me to elaborate tarmac and road super graphics, um, which was an emerging trope for us as a tool for situational like organization and common accounts. Um, and so some of these images as well have traveled a bit beyond the context of the exhibition in Venice. Um, this one, Benjamin's vision, uh, was included in Hans Ulrich Obrist and Douglas Copeland and Shimon Bazar's exhibition, Age of You, uh, which is at Art Jamil in Dubai now. Um, it's in their forthcoming book, The Extreme Self. Um, and largely, I think, you know, the images in the series kind of oscillate between the uncanny and like full on sci fi abstraction, uh, often responding to art historical references concerned with world building. Um, and many of these images further atomize uh, the scaffold and grid logic of my earlier gardens and other images. Um, and I think are really kind of all invested in the same compositional games initiated there. Uh, and with more or less, you know, like the, the kind of even population of the field. Um, there's a resonance in, in much of this work with many of the representational attitudes of postmodernism in architecture. Um, Though much of my own work and, and with common accounts, especially, we often absorb and represent visual tactics from that period as a way of locating our own discursive stance. Um, I'll offer like an example uh, with the project that Igor and I developed as our thesis at Princeton, Closer Each Day, The Architecture of Everyday Death. We began examining the future of death and funeral uh, with a focus on the material element and uh, new human remains disposition, disposal technologies that might serve as an anchor for new forms of ceremony and memorial. Um, noting that, you know, death hadn't really occupied a major space of concern for the discipline of architecture since postmodernism. Um, and yet the world over, death management issues are reaching new extremes even before this pandemic. Uh, and frankly, everyone remains death's client. Um, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, when, when death and the cemetery was kind of an active um, project for, for uh, a number of Western architects, you know, like Aldo Rossi, John Hayda, Carlos Scarpa, uh, Gunnar Asplund, they all kind of emphasized the spatial and like narrative poetry of their columbaria cemeteries and, and crematoria. Um, but many cities today, you know, have run out of land to accommodate these kinds of schemes and Architecture has largely moved on from the design of death to other interests. In its place, um, other industries have stepped in to design the technological and spatial aspects of death care, helping further modernity's hygienic distancing of death from daily life that was in a way like mirrored by postmodernism's effort to isolate death as an existentially remote state of being, an island apart from daily life. And so we were interested in reversing this distancing uh, as a means of expanding access and producing value, be it ecological, social, or material, um, from a nearness to death, uh, arguing instead for its atomization into the ordinary. In this uh, processing drawing, we acknowledge this as a counterposition to the metaphorical attitude advanced by Aldo Rossi and his peers uh, by borrowing the color scheme, abstraction of ground, and the long uh, shadows uh, drawn like a sundial's imprint from his famous 1971 drawing of the San Cataldo Cemetery in Modena. Um, and you know, where my solo images maybe kind of live in like the middle gray tones and black and white, uh, in common accounts, we really established an alibi for color um, and with it, a set of discursive responsibilities pointing back to the references um, and the kind of uh, stance that we were somehow kind of staking a claim uh, against. Um, and so the processing image here like really reflects also a second influence um, with the hijacked zigzagging organization um, from a 1852 drawing from the Illustrated News of London of the Duke of Wellington's spectacular funeral parade of that year. Um, 
so long that it had to double back on itself again and again just to fit on this page. Um, it had filled Victorian London with an estimated 3 million spectators, uh, was led with a carriage designed by Gottfried Semper, cast from iron cannons the Duke had captured in battle against the French, um, which we saw as a, like a transmutation of his physical self um, as transport technology. Um, and this spurred all sorts of, you know, spin-off celebrations and microeconomic events in 1852 in its wake. Um, but really, we, we love the promise of its meandering representation in that source and, and also um, of a, an architecture that would really kind of come out and participate in the streets um, and, and maybe in turn sort of spur that kind of activity. Uh, and really, our fascination with parades has persisted. Uh, with a series of speculative processions that materialize niche categories of contemporary political concern. Um, these are set to launch with the forthcoming issue of Perspecta Journal this fall. Um, we have a parade of all the fields. There's a parade of healthy oceans, a parade of uncertain possibilities. At the right here, you have the parade of eternal smiles. Um, we, we, and, and it's sort of a, a growing uh, archive. It may be worth noting too that our practice has effectively operated remotely uh, since we left school five years ago, uh, with Igor and I really rarely in the same place at the same time. So much of our communication and sketch work is really contained in WhatsApp. Um, and our shared Dropbox folder um, is an archive from which we draw on many of the same blocks, models, and digital assets, which in a way lubricates this kind of like easy migration of familiar parts between both our desktops and across projects. Um, you can see here, for instance, with hands uh, that have reappeared or been reformed in, in um, both Instagram filters, uh, animations that we're now doing uh, in kind of slow videos, uh, as well as in drawings and social media um, on the cover of a, a magazine that we proposed. Um, and indeed, you know, most images begin with like a cursory hand drawing uh, and files do pass back and forth between the two of us. Um, we have a really similar technical skill set to maintain fluency with the files the others produced. Um, you can see here this drawing for uh, what we call the alkaline swamp, beginning with a, a hand drawing. Um, this one I only show close up in Photoshop because we, we drew it through really, really kind of primitive means, just like hard edged brushes uh, and did it almost in a kind of like pointillism. Um, for the inaugural Sol Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism in 2017, um, the co-directors uh, Alejandro Zarapolo and Kyungmin Pai um, commissioned common accounts to materialize some of these ideas that we have uh, around death and the design of the self. Um, and so Igor and I proposed a prototypical funeral home centered around the management of both the virtual and corporeal remains of the dead. One of the more novel and increasingly plausible alternatives in remains disposition uh, is a process called alkaline hydrolysis. Um, it's been branded by one provider in the industry as flameless or liquid cremation. Through an hours long process, the body is essentially liquefied into a fertile solution and dissolved into its constituent amino acids, sugars, peptides and salts in a live bath. The entire process takes place in a pressurized steel container um, with an internal temperature of 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and the outcome is a liquid rich with enzymatic bug particles. Um, and once diluted, can really become a fertilizer, which is what we propose to do um, in this case, that the fluid remains of the urban dead uh, be made available to loved ones a, as a fertilizer to encourage the growth of plant matter in memorial gardens. And even, you know, we were kind of conscious too of like the other outputs, the kind of energetic and thermal outputs, um, the warmth that this process generates. There are uh, crematoria in other places of the world where the heat from their retorts um, are redirected, for instance, um, to heat a public swimming pool nearby uh, for kind of public consumption and offering one last kind of sensuous encounter with the dead in the public realm. And this is something like, this is how we were kind of thinking about how death might be kind of 
um, imagined uh, anew with, with the kind of advent of these technologies. Um, and, you know, in a country of roughly like 50 million people, about one fifth of South Korea's population lives in Seoul, um, and more than 80% live in cities countrywide. And I'll just say that, you know, our work on death really began in the American context, but this project for the Seoul Biennale was really interested in kind of adapting it to um, the context uh, on the Korean Peninsula, where certainly death related issues had kind of been reaching new extremes. There was a shortage of facilities to deal um, with death. And um, through meetings with a lot of local experts, um, urban planners uh, and designers, um, we started to kind of shape this thing to many of the traditions that uh, were already sort of present. Um, and although like three quarters of the population identify as Christian or atheist, um, many of South Korea's cultural traditions around death are really informed by uh, Confucian heritage. Um, and since the Korean War, Seoul has urbanized so extensively that most single story residential neighborhoods and Hanok uh, courtyard houses where funerals were once held have been leveled to make way for higher density development. And so as a result of this, both the location and the form of funerals in Seoul have become a subject for redesign in the last few decades. Um, and the development of the city has also minimized available land for burial, which 30 years ago here was arguably the only acceptable means of remains disposition in the country. Um, and now a uh, majority of Koreans have indicated a preference for cremation over burial, which is what this newscast is, is demonstrating. Um, though too few crematoria exist to serve the demand. And so cities are really looking for new solutions. Um, our site for the Biennale was a refurbished Hanok uh, near Seoul's historic center. Uh, but honestly, it really could have been constructed in many places, um, as was our position that funerary events could be atomized throughout the city as a step toward the democratization of and expansion of access to death care. Um, we installed the steel frame above an alkaline hydrolysis machine, which was generously donated by Supreme Thermal Instrument, uh, planted in the Hanuk's courtyard. Um, and though uh, use of the machine for humans uh, in Korea at the time would have been illegal under current regulations, um, it, it really kind of sat there as a model waiting to be switched on. And so the steel structure, uh, we called the ceremonial space frame. Um, it was a composition of nearly 30 one meter cubic frames welded together from fine steel members. And it hosted an arsenal of ceremonial infrastructure visible above the rooftops of the neighborhood. Um, this is a, a, a sort of illustration of an adaptation. It now lives at the MMCA Museum in Seoul. Um, but from its limbs, uh, floating lightly a couple meters above the house, we hung flags, planting boxes irrigated by alkaline remains from below, and bright yellow ropes slung as if from stanchions, connoting a dignified realm beyond which something significant, but also infrastructural, as you can tell by the kind of neon yellow coloring, uh, was taking place. And hoisted on semicircular segments uh, from the frame, you could see slogans which read closer each day in English and in Korean letters. Um, and at the frame center uh, were tanks filled by the output of the hydrolysis system below. Um, and so you can see there's also a, a curtain of golden fabric shrouding the machine in the courtyard, uh, but it could be opened by a curious visitor uh, intent on inspecting the machine it protected. Um, and in all, the steel structure was supported on six slim circular steel columns, two of which landed on the outside of one wing of the Hanok, framing its uh, entrance on the alleyway. To manage virtual remains, we simulated a virtual afterlife upload portal inside the Hanok, um, where a television screened the online crowdsourcing of a digital archive. Here, the giga remains of the urban dead would be gathered by a community of online peers into a memorial vault. Um, the message boards would uh, showcase notes and RIPs. Since this was a, a funeral, someone had to die. Um, so we worked with uh, Dassel Han, a design student based in Seoul at the time, uh, produce a fictional character whose simultaneous and like authentic online avatars were all memorialized at this funeral alongside her corporeal remains, hence the title Three Ordinary Funerals. 
Um, and the upload portal screen then was like a platform for images and video uh, to cross ephemerally as they were uploaded before being stored for posterity in a digital vault. Also through the afterlife portal, one could track the progress of the sprouts growing from the garden suspended in the space frame uh, via 24 hour CCTV feed among the flags, tubes and tanks. And in that sense, images of the deceased, uh, both in life and in their transfigured transmaterial re-embodiment uh, were a critical output of, of the funeral home. We spent several days on the outskirts of Seoul using stencils to hand paint a black and white floral graphic onto the steel armature that was designed to emerge from the Hanok courtyard. And this motif, um, it was an abstraction of chrysanthemums uh, and other flowers with um, significance in local funerary traditions. We stenciled uh, the visual like potpourri across every limb of the structure. And, and the motif as well was really inspired in part by an interview Igor and I conducted two years earlier with Patrick Burke, uh, who is Michael Graves deputy on the Swan and Dolphin Hotel um, for Disney's amusement park at Epcot. Shortly after Michael Graves uh, had died, uh, Patrick Burke told us how Princeton's School of Architecture Library had received a new monograph on uh, Joseph Hoffman in uh, 1986, around the time that Disney had commissioned the hotel. A crucial condition of Graves' contract with Disney was that the hotel be thematized, uh, a stipulation that found legal articulation uh, through the term extraordinary decoration in the architect's contract with uh, Disney and with Tishman Realty. Um, Graves was a little sort of apprehensive about the idea of a kind of thematized hotel uh, and how that would square with this sort of architectural um, uh, you know, approach. And Burke and Graves, um, having just discovered Hoffman's use of floral patterns, uh, demonstrated in the sketch for a children's room uh, for the house of Ernst Bauer from 1927, seen here, and also um, in photos of the Austrian pavilion at the International Expo of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts in Paris in 1925, thought maybe this would be a way forward that could kind of be acceptable and, and sort of square well with, with their own kind of uh, uh, attitude and approach. As well, um, they were sort of funnily enough influenced by an encounter with Albert Stockdale's iconic Martinique banana leaf wallpaper during a design meeting at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Um, when Graves' team uh, you know, saw that as a kind of way forward for a banana leaf paint by numbers, which came to flank the Dolphin Hotel's pyramid, uh, while a wave motif occupied the swan facade. Um, and we, in turn, became intrigued with Hoffman's florals uh, and how the floral motif could allow us to signal in the novel um, a connection to more familiar funerary traditions from the past and present. One year later, we revisited this effect with a vinyl pattern applied to the columns of the Refresh Renew Pavilion, uh, which we installed in Rome during Igor's term as a fellow at the Spanish Academy in 2018. Um, this time not of chrysanthemums, but with an abstraction of scaled up muscle fibers. Um, Refresh Renew, was a funerary fitness catafalque uh, bitten, uh, built in Piazza di San Pietro in Montorio, just a few meters away from Bramante's Tempietto. The pavilion with a yoga ball canopy, uh, improvised exercise apparatus, uh, and a server block uh, would host fitness content and gym selfies recorded on its physical exercise platform as an act of eternalizing the body shaped there. By rearticulating gym traditions and technologies, the pavilion seizes on the increasing production and circulation of images of bodies um, in, in kind of the popular imaginary now, um, and really kind of capitalizes on their capacity to construct vast personal archives as a project of memorial. And recent cases of online funeral memorialization through the practice of fitness specifically um, have brought to the surface, I think, like a really long historical lineage of relationships between body culture and death that span from the practice of athletics at Etruscan funerals to the development of contemporary mass fitness programs by the American military. And this makes sense to us, I think, you know, given that we can locate fitness and health and death all kind of on a sliding scale of self-construction and self-destruction. We might think, for instance, uh, also of Gottfried Semper's 1862 text, um, on the common origins of vessels 
relating to performances of hygiene and death, like the canopic vase in the funerary urn or the bathtub in the sarcophagus. And so in this context, um, Facebook's first significant encounter with death, which was prompted by an amateur fitness coach in 2012, claiming access to the digital remains of his dead son, um, shows the displacement of spaces of mourning to areas like the common section of a YouTube channel or a home gym or muscle itself. And so the muscular fiber motif on the metal columns here, we created by sampling um, from the image of raw meat on Stamo Papadaki's unused uh, design for the Mechanization Takes Command book cover from 1947. Papadaki's cover was commissioned by Siegfried Gideon, um, but it wasn't used ostensibly because it didn't arrive in time for printing. Um, but Igor encountered this uh, in the ETH archives in Zurich when he was doing some research on our project on death. Um, and it, we were just kind of immediately like magnetized to it. Um, and so, I mean, in some ways, both Three Ordinary Funerals and Refresh Renew adapt the grid framework and scaffold logic also developed in parallel in the rare item pleasure garden images. And they all sort of emerge at the same time. Um, and as well, these projects all really contend with the management of living matter as a pragmatic tool for city building. Um, our practice, as I mentioned, is really less interested in a single formal resolution of the macro scale. We're more preoccupied with the performative possibilities of the situation composed from many parts. Um, and really, we often find it's difficult to propose anything weirder than the real events and trends we encounter in our research. So our design labor is usually oriented around reorganizing, reconcentrating extant features of, of those realities, which I think also kind of explains the provisional language um, of these as assemblies. I think it's an approach that kind of longs for flexibility uh, and points maybe to our desire for the construction of a milieu and like activity itself. Um, and that I think is the shared priority of both these channels of work at the moment. We're attempting to materialize situations really where design is active in the management of event and itinerary and protocol. Um, and our representational work in many ways just uh, works to describe that attitude. That's all I got. Amazing. Thank you, Kit. Mark. Thanks a lot. Yeah, fairly on time. It's really good. <laughs> We're trying. Well, you have. Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, trying to okay turn on the camera. Um, hello. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, lovely presentation. And um, I'm trying to formulate my question, but clearly. But um, I'll try. So I was just. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated how uh, you started being like, I never uh, built a building, but I think there's much more architecture in what you, in your presentation, because it's really like a critical approach and trying to really understand this sort of mix between reality and the effect um, on this, of this representation as an extension of death, but at the same time, it, um, it unfolds on the reality again. So, um, and I was just thinking while you were presenting about um, uh, Hito Steirel, I don't know if I pronounced the name correctly, um, which is kind of like, yeah, have an a, a, a old writing about in defense of the poor image, but I find really fascinated this, um, relation between the image and sort of how the, the reality of that and how she concludes the essay. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm maybe uh, read for uh, about the uh, poor image is not longer about the real thing, um, but it's about reality. So I was just wondering, um, yeah, if you have any reflection on that. So it's not really a question, but um, yeah, really fascinating. So much to think. Yeah, thank you. That, that's so thoughtful. Um, we, we, I mean, so the, the, the entry place for us with both images and, and the kind of construction of the self um, was really this first really problematic case for Facebook in which someone died online and, and, 
their family wasn't satisfied with the access that they didn't have to that person's digital remains, which were photos and videos. Um, and and that, that's where it became clear to us that um, death had kind of migrated from uh, the spaces that were designed for it and for mourning. Um, and, and that also that the internet had kind of uh, made those issues come to the fore in, in new ways, but also sort of um, made it easier for death to simply become an inflection point in the ways that we design ourselves. That, that in life, we are kind of, um, you know, constructing or maintaining the self, photographing it, documenting it, shaping it, dieting, fitness, fashion, whatever. Um, and that now in death, there was a kind of, um, you know, an immediate and accidental archive and memorial already constructed that we had made in life. Um, and that we, and, and not only that, but also the kind of like, exchanges in media and text and, you know, recordings, whatever we might have. Um, this makes me think about like what Marshall McLuhan says about this when, when your um, image is sort of broadcast on TV um, or I guess now in any other kind of, you know, visual platform, um, you lose your private identity and it now belongs to a larger kind of cosmos and public and I think that that is really kind of where we were interested in, in working um, through architecture. There is um, a question from Connie in the chat. Uh, hi, Miles. Uh, thank you for, for the presentation. Did you find death to be a taboo uh, in design practice? And did the fear of dealing with death impede in any way the act of design? Right. Um, it, I mean, there, there is no sort of monolithic um, uh, culture um, around death, uh, right? Like, you know, it's, it's totally different, uh, both in the way we kind of approach it culturally, but also even at the individual scale, depending on who you're speaking to, in what context, what recent encounters they might have had um, with loss or with death. So, um, you know, I think in this work, it's, it's been important for us to be really, you know, cognizant of who we're speaking with and, and, and what those kinds of um, terms are that might have shaped their experience or, or might shape their perception of our work. Um, but I will say that I think the, the urgency with which death care as a kind of uh, industry, but also just like as a managerial reality of urban life today, um, the, the shortage of it um, worldwide, especially in really kind of dense mega cities, uh, is becoming such that we've even engaged in conversations with people who have recently had, you know, loved ones die. And simply because they had gone through really kind of difficult process of even just finding an opening at a crematorium or finding a plot. I mean, this isn't the universal condition right now. Um, if someone dies here in Toronto, it's fairly easy to find burial ground for them. But in Seoul, for instance, we met with the deputy urban planner at the time. His father had, had just passed away and we were trying to, you know, we're here like pitching liquefaction as like the cool new thing. And, you know, I mean, we, you don't know how someone's gonna to respond to that, but actually his response was like, yeah, maybe we should think about this because I don't know, I just went through this and it was like totally impossible to just find an opening um, and, and the infrastructure that we do have is so restricted or so constrained to one or two types and locations um, that I think, you know, if anything, we're, we're really just trying to advocate to open up a conversation to form maybe new consensus around how death is shaped um, in, in, you know, for the kind of public benefit. Um, probably I can step in and, and ask you um, a quick question about how real is your virtual platforms? 
So uh, it seems that the boundary, uh, I mean, the, the idea of the site uh, has been expanded in, uh, in, in your practice, basically, from even from the images to, to, to projects with briefs and to, to narratives that you, you built up yourself. So uh, can, you, can you elaborate about that? Yeah, do you mean like how real, um, like are we building out these these uh, technologies or like interfaces to really kind of work or? It's not more, mostly about, let's say the reality of experiencing an architectural space or spatial, uh, yeah. let's say. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that that too, I mean, has, has power uh, for us and, and a, a, an attraction. Um, I mean, more and more, um, I would say there is an effort to translate things to a kind of material instantiation in our work. Like we, we want to build some things and that, you know, there, there have been buildings now and other kind of built works that I haven't, you know, kind of woven into this presentation, but that really do force us to um, ask of ourselves, what do we want to encounter in that kind of experience in, in the physical? Um, I, I think largely, you know, we've always been kind of interested in like, um, and I think a lot of people are interested in kind of, you know, so-called like bridging this gap or, or kind of perceived gap between like digital experience and, and the kind of world around us. We're not really so worried about bridging a gap, but but we are always kind of interested in like, okay, well, like if you were to look around you, do you see that this is a world in which there is an internet or that like these things are kind of inevitable? Um, and a, a lot of the times we don't like, you know, those, those things are kind of subtle realities which live in other channels mediated by like this screen and, and you know, this web hosting platform. Um, and so we sort of just became interested in like, you know, there's probably an opportunity there for um, the kind of access in milieu, like, like even just this, seeing a hundred faces in a grid all available at once. Um, there is something there that can be translated, I think, to the kind of material world. And that's sort of where a lot of our kind of built work um, enters. Um, and, and so like with the catafalque, in Rome, that like just as a kind of uh, architectural precedent, catafalques are super interesting. I didn't really know them until kind of Igor brought them to me, but there are these sort of small like tempietos that are, are kind of remote uh, funerary monuments. So often they would be built by sort of the wealthy or by, um, uh, you know, rulers in territories that they might have had a presence in economically or politically but weren't themselves necessarily physically present in when they died. And so it was a kind of remote way of acknowledging someone who is at this really kind of, you know, uh, distant geography um, and maybe even like time scale, like maybe it's built months after they've actually died. And so there was something there that was like so contemporary, right? Like that is the internet too, or like that we, we do that with the internet. Um, and so we were kind of, interested in like reviving that as a as a type um for for some kind of weird digital experience i guess oh hamid you're muted yeah, sorry I, I was just saying that alessandra wrote me a note that she had to attend actually the opening of the fire june that uh, she showed so she executed her, herself so uh, we won't have her, sadly, for the uh, discussion afterwards. Is there any other reflection? Yes. Um, there is another question by uh, Fatima in the chat. Uh, thanks, Miles, for, for the inspiring presentation. My question was that have you considered the role of religion uh, that, death is, uh, that death dictates in some cultures in regards to the death, or, or have you imagined your proposal to only be implemented uh, in atheist cultures? Yeah, um, no, I, I think that they, the, the sort of structures we propose are similarly like conceptually and, and physically, literally um, kind of a scaffold, a framework that can really kind of accommodate um, a lot of different sort of uh, 
performances or or like performances of um, one's own beliefs um, and desires. I think, you know, for instance, in Seoul, um, we had all of the basic strategies um, kind of developed before we came to the site, but then in how each one ultimately was shaped or conformed to that, you know, um, to that place was really through the lens of ongoing kind of consultation um, and, and sort of sketching, um, I mean that sort of in a not literal sense, um, with a number of experts, um, both people who are working with us on our team, like Ji Hui Li um, and, and uh, others. But, but basically, there were a lot of moments where we tried to find kind of convenient resonances between like the technological um, and the, the religious or kind of like erratic so, you know, our belief is that like a lot of religious ceremonies too are, are based in um, technological events or technological practices that have just been in practice for so long that they, they become sort of absorbed um, by religion. So for instance, with three ordinary funerals, a Confucian, uh, a sort of traditional Confucian ceremony is often a multi-day affair, currently three days. And so ours too was a kind of three day funeral um, in which we sort of observed these three different online avatars, um, all of the different substances, both kind of virtual um, and which was like sublimated to the cloud, which although is like purely technological, felt very kind of religious in a way um, in its imagery. Um, but as well, there, there were a number of different um, sort of details around um, how that how that ceremony was shaped, which were really kind of just borrowing opportunistically, I think, from um, existing religious um, ceremonies in the Korean context. There is a comment uh, by, by Rosie, I love how your projects consider the balance and the future of human life in relationship to the built and natural world, rather than aiming to create on top of what we already live within. Such thoughtful working and beautiful work. Thank you, Rosie. Amazing. Hello, Miles. Uh, we have a Dorda uh, comment here. Thank you for an outstanding presentation. One short question would be, uh, what are your most inspiring readings about uh, the process of image making? Mm. Um, that's interesting. Um, it's fun. I, I started teaching um, a representation class for all the incoming MRC students at um, the Daniels faculty at, at University of Toronto last year, um, which was kind of a daunting uh, undertaking because representation is something that I've, um, you know, always done, but even a lecture like this, you know, this is a, a kind of, uh, self like reflexive autopsy that I rarely engage in with the work that we actually produce. Um, so I, I'm a little ashamed to say that my bibliography in that regard is like, you know, I don't think there's anything that's sort of um, unconventional, other than that we're we're kind of interested in like, um, I suppose, reading. Very, very, actually, you know what? I would say um, Sylvia Laban is really kind of one of the most inspired uh, uh, and, and inspiring sort of authors for us in terms of how um, she is able to able to find a kind of like cause and, and um, the reason for an image's aesthetic, color, uh, content, and, and form um, as, a, as a direct result of like the economic, political, um, and, and like cultural context in which they emerge. I, I think that, you know, she's the one who kind of like cracks the code and like cuts through uh, the other stuff, you're like, wow, I love how this person was kind of using images or how Warhol was like making prints at this time. I was like, okay, well, it's because of this, you know, I just, I, I love the way that she's able to ascribe to the aesthetic, um, all of these kind of 
uh, measurable realities that in, in fact kind of informed that work. We have uh, two more questions, even three more questions uh, in the chat. Uh, Tabitha, thank you much for the brilliant presentation. I'm interested to know uh, what you think about the physical integrity of the living body in its experience of the digital, as well as the body's physical integrity after death. You spoke a lot about uh, cremation and liquidation of the body. Do you feel perhaps the body's physical physicality is being lost in the digital age? Um, it's a super interesting question. Um, Douglas Copeland has this, you know, he said in, in the past few months, like, he thinks that the, the sort of the biggest issue we face um, in the kind of years to come is like humanity's inability to really kind of face up to reality, uh, perhaps kind of exacerbated by this um, year of like hermetic digital uh, engagement. Um, so I, you know, I think that these are all like, it, it depends who you're asking. It depends what, what your sort of situation is, what your privilege is in terms of the, the way that you kind of see your digital self or, or engage with the world. Um, I think, I think, you know, what we're seeing is a kind of multiplication, um, of channels in which people feel like they are shaping themselves simultaneously. Um, and that means that your sense of self is maybe kind of delegated across images, across platforms, across mediums. Um, and perhaps as those selves multiply, so too does your opportunity, you know, your ability to kind of um, change them so that, you know, you you kind of embody different selves. I mean, I was we were thinking with three ordinary funerals about this text from um, uh, Cahill um, and Emily Siegel, the the trend forecasting group, which I don't know if they're active. But she she now runs Nemesis, but in 2013 they wrote um, Youth Mode, uh, a guide for freedom, manual for freedom, and and this is where um, no I don't know Youth Mode though, and um, this is where the term um, norm core emerged and and what they kind of meant was like the simultaneous but separate and authentic inhabitation of like totally different um cultures and like niche groups that that you could belong to multiple different tribes and kind of like exist fully and committedly in one kind of in the morning and yet like participate in a totally different social sphere in the afternoon um, and that that was also kind of lubricated by, by the internet's ability to connect us with like good high resolution information that could allow you to authentically um, know a world that you might not otherwise have had access to. And so I think that's sort of an example of like how not only do we kind of detach or, or reattach to our bodies when it's convenient as, as a kind of um, as, as we reattach to different senses of ourselves, but we can also kind of disconnect them from each other um, and inhabit kind of like simultaneous lives and identities. Uh, probably as the last question for this session uh, by Florian, uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. It was fascinating. Could you talk a bit about your take on the responsibility of the designer in the context of cultural influence, especially when it comes to the uh, visceral and for many, if, if not all, cultures, fun, a foundational subject, that is death. Uh, how do you position yourself as an individual in relation to these collectives? Yeah, um, we, responsibility of the designer um, in the context of cultural influence. I would say, I mean, what we're often really trying to do is to kind of bring, um, look at situations where design is active, but designers are not necessarily present or, or like trained designers are not necessarily present and learn from the kind of abundant intelligence that's already kind of active and present in those worlds. Um, and, and that I, you know, for us feels like where, where we are at home, uh, which is just kind of working almost in a documentary mode, excavating these realities that we weren't familiar with before um, and perhaps translating or, or opening up some of that material 
um, into contexts like this, where where maybe they can kind of enter um, the radar of of you know more institutionalized spaces of design. Um, there's a lot of design intelligence out there, um, and a lot of design activity where um, architecture and, and other kind of design industries are notably absent or or don't really have an interest. Um, and and yet that's where most people in the world, I think, are engaging design practices. And so um, I think if anything, we're, we're just trying to kind of open up a little bit um, channels of communication and, and knowledge sharing between them. Thank you so much, Mars. Thank uh, you. David, probably uh, you can start as the next, but not least. Not last. Can you un unmute yourself or no? Oh, sorry. What happened? Okay, ah. great. No, I, you guys froze, and so I had to leave the chat and come back in. So I think I'm I'm a, a new participant now, <laughs> which I'm not sure if that means that I can still share. Um, yeah, I think I can. Yes, you can now. I think you have pause. Great, thanks. Well, it, just to to kind of start off and maybe wrap up and also present at the same time. Um, I, I wanna echo the other participants kind of um, sincere thanks to, to you, Hamed and, and uh, Platon remotely for, the, for another invitation to kind of participate in this. It's, it's amazing the diversity of practices that you guys um, put together for these events. And it's a, it's a real joy, you know, frankly, um, to, to hear about people's work and also to kind of kind of uh, interrogate how they are working within ideas of media or ideas of representation, which of course is something that uh, Hamed and Platon, you both know that it's near and dear to my heart and has been the subject of my own sort of pedagogy for the last, um, last couple of decades. Uh, the diversity of the group uh, puts a, a little bit of a burden upon me to to find those connective tissues, um, and I think that what I'll what I'll do is um, I'll begin with a very brief overview of some of my current research and the the ways in which I look um, intellectually at the position of the image in terms of research and practice. Um, and then towards the end, to introduce kind of a conversation, um, I'll, I'll propose some, um, some provocations maybe <laughs> about um, different stakes on, on what it means to work representationally and also what it means to work non-representationally, because I feel like all the, the guests today are doing both and they're moving back and forth. And that's something that, that I'm quite... Um, interested in uh, discussing with everyone. So perhaps I will um, share my screen with you. Hopefully this will work. Okay, you can see that? Great, thanks, Ahmed. Um, so I've, I've kind of titled this Kind of summation, if you will, uh, the material media research and practice. And material media is a, a term that I, I shouldn't say I coined, but it's one that I used uh, and, and wrote uh, in my own PhD research to try to explain um, the ways in which I was looking at um, the historiographies of the land that I was working on and, and working in, I should mm -hmm. say. Uh, and I, I, I should also um, acknowledge the, the Marilinga Jerija as the traditional owners of this land that I'm conducting my research on and um, uh, convey my respect to uh, elders past and present. Um, so in my, in my work, I was looking, as Hamid said in, my, in the introduction that, and the bio that, that we wrote, um, the work that I was doing was looking at an area uh, in South Australia in which the British used for nuclear weapons testing. And my interest in that um, 
was not so much retelling the history of that uh, because other people have done that at a much greater uh, skill than I could, specifically people like Elizabeth Tynan, um, but instead was to look at the condition as the land sits today. And that's uh, 70 years on after uh, multiple remediation attempts and multiple interventions in trying to, um, in some ways, fix the damage, but in other ways, in most ways, uh, simply hide the damage. And so as someone with a background in architecture, uh, not practicing, but as someone with a background in the discipline of architecture, and then someone also, I, I spent many years um, running a photography and situated uh, media degree in Australia, in which kind of a combination of um, photography and, and critical spatial practice, I guess you could say. Um, looking at this site uh, with the skills that, that, that I had accrued, but also looking at it, uh, trying to uncover what was hidden or interred in, this, in the site. Um, I began my research with this image, and this image became the most important image that I found. Uh, it's an image produced by the Australian military. And the reason why this is important is this is a moment in which the Maralinga Jerija people, represented by Keith Peters on the, on the left, were finally given full control over their lands again. And um, I shouldn't say it was a handback because there was never um, a moment of uh, ceding the land. Uh, this was, of course, one of many moments of, of colonial um, dispossession. But the, the, the reason why this image is important for my own research was the fact that the two officials you see here are providing the Maralinga Jerija with a commemorative object to commemorate, sorry, to, commem to commemorate the, this um, event. And the image is a map of a military um, base. So instead of commissioning something more um, friendly, <laughs> something more culturally appropriate, or something more, at least more uh, inventive, they instead presented a formal map of the, the thing that caused the trauma that supposedly they were uh, remediating at this moment. And for me, this showed a continuation of an inability to see trauma, right? An inability to kind of understand what would happen, what had happened at the site, and an inability to, even at this moment, of official kind of land handover to um, not, uh, to, to, to be unable to acknowledge the sovereignty of, of a people that had lived on a land for tens of thousands of years. Of course, this is also representation. This is an abstraction of a place. This is an architectural drawing. This is the way you know our field is is based on the abstraction of physical things into um, orthographic projection. So here we have another orthographic projection, but not only of a place, but of of trauma. This isn't the first one. This is the the most recent in a history in Australia of uh, of thousands of these representations, right? And so um, in my PhD and in, in my research, I uncovered um, a series of these maps and looked at the ways in which this land had been described by colonial cartographers. And one of the ways they called it was no man's land. They, they were very keen to wipe all history away uh, from a place and to affix it with a title, and this is an Austrian map maker that made this particular one. They use an English phrase, actually a British phrase, uh, to describe an area as no man's land when there was plenty of other places on this map in which there is no obvious uh, colonial habitation. But for some reason, this area had to be called no man's land. Quickly, this is a map that shows the inhabitation of the continent that we now call Australia prior to the British invasion in 1770. And what we see here is hundreds of separate and individual uh, cultures, countries, and languages that were existing on the continent um, for what people are now thinking could be as, as many as 80,000 years. 
So if we come back to this image now, we can see that the, the kind of um, the use of representational media um, becomes a pointed end of a spear uh, that has a smile on it and, and, and white tan people. Now the land as it, as it exists today, um, and this is the most of these images from now on are going to be my own my own work. Um, the land as it exists today looks something more like this. And this um, this is an image that's probably familiar to all of you, even if you've never been to Australia. This is what you imagine Australia to look like, you know, red land, flat, uh, infinite horizon. But in Maralinga, um, a lot of the land does look like this. And so the images that you take when you're there, the photography that you take tends to have a reference to a colonial understanding of what this land already was. But if you look closer and if, and if uh, this series of images starts to reveal uh, interventions, and so if you look at this image, you can see kind of a regular horizontal display of, of white rectangles. What those small signs are representing is the perimeter of the land that they've determined as being radioactive, right? So that once you cross that white line, and I'm standing in the irradiated side, not on the other side. So I'm looking at the back of those signs. These images begin to reveal subtle um, hints about what happens under your foot. Now, some of the, the um, objects of that moment are still there, right? So this is a piece of sand that was fused into um, a glass-like uh, object from the heat from one of the blasts. This exists on the land if you look underfoot and it crunches as you walk around. So some of this still remains, but most of it does not. But what does remain is an almost infinite supply of media documentation and um, discussion of what happened there. So part of my research uh, and ongoing research is looking at the ways uh, that different governmental bodies, uh, media organizations, um, popular media, how they describe what happened in this land, right? So uh, when you combined, when you combine rather the, the media, oh, sorry, when you combine the, the media that's at hand with the, the material and at hand with the, the media that surrounds it. Uh, this is what I mean when I talk about the material media histories of a site. Now, these are historical photographs that were taken during the remediation. And what of course was done was the construction of vast burial pits, huge uh, you know, 30 meter deep um, pits that were used to to bury the radioactive waste. But what you're left with is something much more subtle and something that is beginning already to fade into the landscape. So here we have a kind of an aerial image of the largest of the burial pits. Uh, you can see the, the outline um, of, the, of the big one in the middle, which is, has a very um, innocent name as the soil burial trench. And that's 500,000 cubic meters of radioactive waste is underneath um, 15 meters of clean soil right there. Now, this was only completed, uh, I'm sorry, this was completed only 20 years ago, I would say. And it's already starting to disappear. It's already starting to be acclimated to its you know, surrounding environment. And there are, uh, the government did a lot to reseed this area and to kind of plant um, uh, new vegetation that would be native to this area in, in hopes of hiding well, what's underground. And of course, that becomes a, um, an ontological issue. What should you hide those things? This is something that many people have been writing about for as long as there's been nuclear waste. How do you convey to someone 20,000 years in the future that there is something very deadly underfoot? Um, the way that the British did it was with uh, concrete plinths. So if you look in the center of this image, there's a plinth that's about two meters tall uh, made of concrete that marks the point in which uh, the largest of the blasts took place. Um, these monuments are already 
disintegrating, right? This media that's meant to uh, explain to us what happened at this site was not built to last. It was not something that was in, intended to actually speak to future generations, but instead was meant to placate the current generation. Um, so these images now, uh, I can quickly go through, show the, the remediation attempt and, and the introduction of foreign soils and chemicals and compounds uh, that are attempting to um, kind of obfuscate uh, a moment of, of intense violence. Uh, and I'll, I'll end with this image um, uh, to, to talk about and to kind of perhaps introduce some of the things that I want to speak in the future or not in the future, but right now, let's just do it right now. And um, what I'd like to talk about, um, I'd like to talk about the representational, uh, the word representation in the title and, and, and to be very clear about how we as, as spatial practitioners use representational media. Um, and I think it's something that's, that's quite unique from discussions of image studies or especially photographic theory. Uh, so um, when we talk about representational media in architecture, I think it's very important to kind of acknowledge the fact that that is um, usually uh, multiple forms of drawings, renderings, uh, and um, technical drawings that we call images sometimes, or we call media, but the, the intent of those, of course, is to read them as a group and then to imagine a projective future, right? So we look at a plan, we look at a section, we look at a, an elevation, and in our minds, we construct that space that then becomes um, a projection about a future project. Um, also, of course, we use things like um, rendering and 3D modeling and, and we use words like photorealistic to describe them. And we, we propose what these objects will be in the future and we give them very specific aesthetics. Um, but of course, photography is non-representational, right? Photography is not projective um, and, and um, uh, Susan Sontag or um, Walter Benjamin or Willem Flusser would, would make a clear distinction about what the role of the photograph is. Of course, Sontag said that the photograph, the, the potential for the, the, the creation of a photograph uh, in contemporary society, and she was writing in the 1970s, that contemporary society was trying to make events that were worthy of being photographed. And so what she was saying was that photography was kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Now that photograph was not projective, right? Um, other people, of course, uh, we, Miles's brilliant discussion of um, the politics of death and the way that we kind of engage with death, um, early advancements in photography were directly connected to death uh, and they were described as such, right? The idea of a memento mori or um, the advancements that uh, happened in photography um, in uh, policing, right? A lot of the development of photography had to do with uh, photographing evidence and violent events and, and, and dead people, right? Um, so photography, I think, is really interesting to talk about um, in relation to uh, media and architecture, uh, because to say that like a rendering is photorealistic, that's an anachronism, right? Because uh, photography inherently uh, is not a projective thing, in my opinion. <laughs> so I think that one, uh, one, um, one thing to talk about in some of the, the projects that we saw today were the ways that we use media to create, um, as, as Miles said, uh, you know, speculative fictions, the ways that we kind of uh, propose a future that is one that we want to create. Um, often those are done with what I would say, like a rendering would be kind of a technical image. And Willem Flusser was very clear about what a technical image was. That was a third, a uh, third level abstraction, right? So the first would be the actual object or 
The second would be a text of the object, whereas a technical image is an abstraction of the text of an object, right? So once you get to a technical image, you're typically, you're, well, most likely in the third level of abstraction. And I think that's an interesting place for us to work within, uh, because once you're in, once you understand that, <laughs> that, uh, that you're working in an abstraction upon an abstraction upon abstraction, uh, then it does give you freedoms uh, to then um, to work in a way in which uh, only you only you understand, or perhaps in a way that that only uh, you can and can dictate. Um, if we go back to uh, Nazgul's uh, brilliant presentation at the beginning, um, there were uh, there were these full scale photographic moments, is what I would call them. The 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 thin sheath of um, the, the um, how do you say, it? it's almost like a, a recreation of those buildings, the interiors of those buildings, um, kind of in a Gordon Matta Clark Walls Papers sort of way. That kind of replication to me felt very proto-photographic. It felt like um, a situation in which we were looking at an analog material that had been gone that had gone through a chemical process to then replicate a, um, a real situation, and I mean that's basically that's basically the definition of photography. Um, and I think those projects were were extremely interesting um, because they really troubled my own argument that I kind of prepared for today, my, they really troubled that argument about non-representational imagery, right? Because once you have replicated something at full scale, is that a representation of the, the building? Or instead, is it its own standalone non-representational object the same way that a sculpture or a photograph would be? Um, and I don't know, I, I, you stumped me on that one. And I, and I think it's a, it was a, a truly, you know, beautiful project, one that I was, I felt um, very close to. I felt like I, I kind of had a, a direct uh, relationship um, with that work. So I know we've lost uh, Alessandra. She's gone for her opening. Um, that work to me, I think that the number one thing that I wanted to bring up and kind of use as a provocation was the, the plastiglomerate uh, discussion, this, this, um, this desire that a lot of us have to create material, right? To create a medium in which to work. Uh, I think it's, it's fascinating to think about that as a, um, as a condition of, of the Anthropocene, right? And to kind of really own that and, and to, to, to also acknowledge the, the issues and violence that are contained in the act of creation. And, I, and I, I just lost my notes here. Maybe I can find them again. Um, but there was a discussion in, in several of the projects about um, uh, creation and destruction, right? Construction and, and destruction. And I think that's not as evident in Alessandro's work, but I think it's truly there, right? Because once you start to, to create these new mediums and then you build them in monolithic ways, uh, you are engaging with kind of entropic forces at that exact moment. Um, so that was really uh, quite fascinating. And then with uh, just, I'm kind of skipping through my notes, so I apologize for that. But uh, in Miles project, uh, Miles uh, presentation, which was also fantastic, um, one of the things that really stuck out and, and, and I wrote down as quick as I could is, he asked if like, if the image was the lone descriptor or like the lone artifact, I think is how you, how you said it. And to me, that is really, that's very provocative to say, right? Uh, and I think that the creation of the image as the artifact, that would be photography, but the creation of like a rendering of, of an artifact the artifact itself is the projection of the thing, right? So it's not so much the image that's the artifact, it's the, the mental um, creation that we have when we look at it. Because of course, when we look at your amazing images, 
oftentimes at kind of axonometric perspective and sort of a God's eye uh, view down, um, we imagine these things as being of some scale that we're standing in front of, right? We don't really imagine them as being in a blue background somewhere. We, I think we see them as like, I could go up and I could grab that, or I could walk on that, or I could, I could circumnavigate it like uh, a piece of sculpture and I would see it as a narrative thing. So I, I would argue in your work that it's, it definitely is not the image, which is your, um, is your artifact. Instead, it's, it's, it's the work. It might not exist, physically in the world uh, in all cases, but it truly exists as a um, speculative piece of architecture, which means it's architectural. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a fun, <laughs> it's, a, it's a productive, uh, maybe fun is too ignorant way to say this. It's a productive way to start to um, imagine the line that we're often treading around between what is architectural and what is image, uh, because they are two distinct things. Okay, that wasn't necessarily a question to put forward, um, but that was kind of my um, my take on what I what I heard today. Um, so perhaps we could open it up to the floor, or Hamid, or Platon, or uh, whomever else uh, to to continue the conversation for Miles or Nazgul. I think it's a it's a really um, provocative series of um, observations, David. Thank you for all those. I, I was thinking, uh, Nazgul, during your presentation and um, around some of the questions uh, from the group um, that were sort of asking, like, um, you know, why this why this media or why this medium for the translation of certain ideas and projects. Um, and I think that that that's very present in my work or, or like those are the kinds of criteria I try to kind of enumerate for myself as well. David speaking to that last observation about like, well, what is the thing? And then like, if this thing is ever gonna be materialized, what thing is being materialized and how, you know, especially having been trained in architecture, I think um, maybe a training in like visual arts specifically would kind of embed with every project like a material inevitability that I just don't think I, I'm equipped with. So like to Nazgul's point, it's like, well, I had to find something that like could hang, that could accommodate that scale of impression that was available. That, and and I, so I think I, I similarly think through those kinds of concerns. And then of course, there's that other thing of like, well, I, when I'm picturing it, it has this kind of tactility and this kind of materiality and it, it, it sort of reads as being this sort of thing and its resolution is only so descriptive. Um, the reason I, I talk about, um, yeah, some of those images as like artifacts is I think that at some point too, like when you start to work the, the representation of the thing and it's not necessarily projective in the sense that like I will this thing into being other than outside of, you know, than, than in the image. Um, and then rework it through like a computer's like, you know, revision and, and that lens or, or think about the grain on the surface. Then you're starting to produce also another event, especially if it's in like the space of a gallery, which is the kind of like physical um, perception or transmission of the thing. Um, and, and also, uh, oddly enough, my gallerist is a photography dealer originally, um, and a big like black and white um, photography collector. Um, so, so that's where that uh, kind of preoccupation, I think, comes from. But as I mentioned in, in the chat, you know, I think it really is born of a kind of like very self-conscious kind of tension of these two um, readings of, of like images at all. Yeah, I think it's one of the, the, it's the, it's the original sin of the architect who perhaps doesn't want to build or is not going to build in thinking that the, the things that they create are somehow less than the thing that's built. And I think it's, that's just a ridiculous proposition that we have to let go of. Um, Cause I think, you know, we would all, we would all agree that there are unbuilt pieces of architecture 
that are as real as any building and that we have the same reverence for them. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's, um, it's interesting how we all use, and I'm putting myself right in there too. We all use this language as though the image is somehow subordinate to the building. And I, I think that's, that's ridiculous. But. Well, even the temporality of all, you know, projects like that, that Nazgul is looking at, like um, in Tehran, it, it seems Nazgul that you're, you're like a, a documentarian of moments that may not exist in, in a kind of near future, right? You're documenting these things which are very live. And in Alessandra's projects, um, you know, these, these pieces might move around or, or create a kind of um, scenario that, that is only there for a few days or for a festival or... Um, and I think in our work, you know, much of the, the things that I showed you today are, are temporary pavilions and like, I'm so satisfied with that. Like I, I like, we got the photo, we're out of here, you know. You know, early on in my career, I, I, in my, in my teaching career, I brought Lebius Woods down to lecture to, to our students. And one of the old professors tried to kind of paint him into a corner for like, not having realized his work and his response was just it was so polite and it was so cutting you know and he was just absolutely clear that um the longevity of the work that he was doing was going to rival if not outlast any building being built right because at the think at the time it was you know the average lifespan of a building in the united states was 20 years well i mean uh, you know, <laughs> his drawings will last much longer than that. Um, so I think that, you know, that was an amazing moment that I kind of, as a very young instructor 20 years ago, I was looking at my students like, <laughs> did you hear that? I mean, because it, it, it means that the work that we're creating in a studio or in a, an academic environment or on our own, um, we have just as much right to those and we have just as much um, right to project those as being a legitimate um, uh, uh, factor in the history of architecture. Uh, the show that, that Hamed just curated um, at Bet's project, I think is evidence to that. And the work that you guys do, you know, that the, all three of the presenters today are doing, I think, you know, we're the temporality that Miles just referenced, I think is, is so crucial because the, the work will still exist, whether or not it's, you know, in front of you physically. I'm, I'm, it's just a fascinating conversation. And what uh, I, I can follow up from what uh, David, uh, let's say, uh, brought up about his observation was uh, oddly the issue of destruction, which is shared today among, uh, <laughs> All four presentations, so it it seems to be an inevitable uh, launching pad for any construction, apparently. So uh, I think not only spatial destruction but also temporal destruction and let's say this destruction and dismantling of time and temporalities was something that is very much present in uh, the four practices, and. Uh, I was just trying to think out loud and get more even excited about uh, uh, bodies that are being dissolved, uh, uh, buildings that are being uh, uh, turned to rubbles, uh, landscapes that are being uh, reshuffled, or I don't know, dunes that are being flattened and, and reshaped into, into a process of, it's, it's actually, I mean, it's the actually, let's say, terraforming an architecture in this absolute sense, even if it's happening uh, through in, in a gallery or in the mind of an observer or uh, in a moving image in a digital platform. So in that sense, I wonder uh, what would be, let's say, uh, the specific relevance of each project, I mean, in, in your practice, saying that, okay, although now's goal, for example, was really talking about and addressing Tehran as a, as a space of reference, but it seems that the work stands independent from that, that context to, to an extent. In um, Miles' uh, practice, actually the use of uh, digital as, 
as as a sort of abstraction, yet very specific because ev every datum is registered and has a physical uh, footprint. Uh, and but it's it's is also shared uh, globally and instantly the moment that is created. So the idea of, uh, let's say, context uh, in its more specific and limiting sense and to the most generic and expanded sense, I think was something that was uh, implicitly challenged today uh, across uh, the, four, the four presentations. So I wonder if you, you guys uh, can, can share your experience if, if, and your intentions probably uh, in some of those projects that uh, that you've shown us. I'm staying quiet because my dog is making a lot of noise in the background, so <laughs> I'm trying not to say much myself. Um, about the context, I think that's um, an interesting um, subject to speak about because um, for me specifically, I mean, I, I, I'm always asked like why I work about Tehran. And um, I say that it's, I only work about Tehran because I happen to be here. My work revolves around the, the context in which I am placed and it becomes only um, um, an excuse to um, sort of uh, touch on upon various subjects that are happening. Um, but at the same time, my personal context is also uh, um, perhaps shares a lot of um, its, its issues, the e events that are happening with so many of the other um, larger or uh, like um, modern cities. So in a way, it's a very good context because um, we probably share so much of the same, um, let's say, issues and experiences. And so it can be implied and, and it can be probably sensed and, and understood by, um, uh, if you take it out of, you know, if you take that subject out of this, this particular context and play it, put it somewhere else. Um, yeah, so so I think this is uh, this is my um, sort of reason behind um, um, yeah description of of working with this particular context and and why. Um, I th I think it's so important. I think it, it's absolutely critical that 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 practitioners do that, that they turn their critical gaze upon their immediate surroundings and that they produce work that allows people from outside of that situation to attempt to understand through their, their media that they create um, a local condition. When you were presenting and, and you kind of made a, uh, you made a corollary to Los Angeles, it immediately like just brought to mind, um, and it's a very obvious reference, but the sort of 50 year practice that Ed Rocher has done in Los Angeles in which he has just kind of fastidiously documented his town uh, with a, a, you know, sometimes a loving gaze, oftentimes a highly, highly critical gaze um, and doing it in a way that provides future uh, viewers of the work to interpret it in the way that they that they see fit, right? And so the your your final project that you showed, um, I don't have the the title of it, but the one that you were doing with the swimming pools, um, that to me felt like a a beautiful extension of kind of 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 Ed Rocher's sort of documentary practice in which he was you know hiring planes and <laughs> flying over Los Angeles and precariously photographing from the back of a pickup truck driving down Sunset Boulevard. You are you using kind of aerial photography then creating 3D models so that we can see the depth of those things and then beautifully and expressively combining those, those empty volumes into something that's your own. And I, I think that's, I think it's beautiful. It also reminds me, are you familiar with the, the Japanese um, work of uh, the, the idea of the hyper art Thomasons? Do you know what this is? 
So in the 1980s, uh, this artist um, started documenting with his uh, kind of colleagues objects in Tokyo that were useless, but perfectly maintained. So mm -hmm. you have like a staircase going up to a blank brick wall, but the railing for the staircase was recently painted. And so why, yeah. why, why would you do that, right? And so um, this was a task that I used to give my young photography students to have them go out into Sydney and to find these moments of kind of maintained obsolescence. And so when you were describing the swimming pools and you said, you know, why haven't they been filled in with earth if they're not going to be used? It immediately brought to mind the, the Thomason. Um, you should look this up because they're, they're absolutely gorgeous photographs that, and now it's been going on for 40 years. So. Which actually this brings to my mind the question of preservation of memory and again, shared mm. in all, all four uh, uh, projects and practices that uh, you guys showed. So in a way it's a kind of, the work is a kind of registration, acknowledgement and cultivation of that memory from its past projected towards future into a very critical eye. So uh, in a way the traces on the walls or uh, let's say the liquids out of body or even the digital images remaining out of uh, a deceased person versus I don't know, the, even uh, the military map and, and the rituals uh, in the dunes, I think they're all representing uh, a lived memory that is, uh, that is turning into a spatial imaginary in, in, in all the four uh, distinct practices that we witness today, which I mean, I would love to hear more about it if uh, how personal it can be and how investigational it would be. I mean, wh where is our role? I mean, as an artist, we just uh, take ourselves as a reference point of uh, those memories, or we can play uh, a third person investigator, observer, forensic, uh, I don't know, agents to, to, to map out and to represent others, uh, others' cases, others' responsibilities and liabilities. Mm. Well, the, Maybe I've spoken too much, but I think that immediately brings to mind documentary photography, right? Because the 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 conceit of that, and which you have to always keep in mind, of course, is that the person taking the image has their entire lived experience that's going to influence and prejudice the images that they make. So there is no such thing as like an innocent uh, documentation of any event. And and once you kind of put that into your head and you realize that all the creation of any photograph or image is always based on prejudice, um, then it becomes a productive space, right? And so then instead of talking about documenting the real or, or like, uh, you know, a moment in time, instead of saying that, you can start to use words like historiographies, right? Because your representation of, or I'm sorry, your documentation of a place is never the true documentation. It's always your own influence yeah you know it makes me think also just like how elastic the idea of like perpetuity is um like david in in those um sort of bunker pits that that you showed um it reminded me of some conversations we've had with um uh cemetery operators you know um in in a context where like we've approached them or they've approached us as like you know potentially working on something together um and it, it's so constrained um, by, by kind of legal definition, uh, uh, you know, and regulation, the space in which sort of um, design is, is up for grabs. Um, in Toronto, um, burial plots now are protected in perpetuity. So if you buy a plot, um, you know, there may be maintenance fees or there may be, you know, dues to pay over time, but your plot is essentially protected forever. That will change, um, but that's the legislation now. Whereas in, in Seoul, the longest um, someone can have a cemetery plot, I think is 60 years. Um, and, you know, when we've gone to these um, cemeteries, like they don't even consider concrete a perpetual material. Um, David, you, you've shown why that's the case. They only work with granite, aluminum, certain materials, and and with certain vendors who are like, 
their their products are so proven or so tested. Um, but I think the the kind of elasticity with which we uh, imagine perpetuity and and therefore the kind of like length or resolution of memory as a kind of um, uh, you know as being mediated by that um, is so flexible. Um, when we started working on death um, and the kind of like digital remains, we were so naive. I mean, we were kind of like, yeah, collect everything and, and make it kind of available for everyone forever. And then Cambridge Analytica happened, you know, and we're like, okay, like collect everything and like lock it away, throw away the key, like it's in this black box. So it's kind of like, it's there, but, but you can never access it again. Um, and and so we started thinking about like a memory that was kind of preserved, but like so concentrated or so localized that it wasn't even available to you or, or not available all the time. And, um, and in, in some ways like that just kind of, uh, I think reflects like the reality of, of memory anyway, right? Which is like some people have it, some people, you know, it's, it's kind of preserved there and, until this person kind of dies or whatever, um, yeah. That's just what comes to mind. Yeah, I also think um, this um, subject subject of preserving something or or, or documenting, as um, also David was putting it, has has come up quite a lot for um, for me as well. And I also mentioned it in um, the presentation that as I'm in a way working quite a lot with the changes that the city is going through in, in one form, um, it does become a documentation, but I'm quite aware that it's a very subjective um, documentation. Um, I think, um, for example, the, the project fabrications, the, the, the architectural models, um, they weren't in, they weren't in, um, uh, in a way at all intended to um, document something. But uh, after a few years, um, I revisited, I wanted to read photograph some of the murals and they were already gone. So in a way they became um, a form of documentation that were quite far removed from the original um, thing, but um, in a way, they, they became a form of um, documentation of something that was happening in a, in a city. And I think that goes back to your um, talking about um, sort of abstraction and, and how um, sort of uh, something like a map or 3D drawing or um, the way that architects practice or deal with space has a um, a level of um, quite a level of abstraction and it's how it's it's far removed but it's a it's a re reciprocal in a way relationship I think in, in you, you could also see it in all of the projects um, uh, that how each of them try to um, either represent a space or to create something that is going to be so it's just it's a back and forth and um, yeah, I, I thought that part um, of your discussion was quite um, fascinating about this this level of abstraction. Yeah, I, I wish that Alessandra was here because there there is a, a conversation that's come up also about kind of model making and whether that digital or physical model making. And it was interesting because she was showing um, uh, scale models, she, I think she called them scale models, but they were, they're actually maquettes because she was using the actual material, right? So you could, you could argue that those scaled versions of her works, I don't know what she, I can't remember what she called those sculptural objects in, in, in the, in, um, that she was designing, but, but being built from the material that they were going to be built, they're, they're more maquettes. They were more just just small versions, <laughs> and I, I, that also kind of confuses some of the things that I think I wanted to say um, because it, she's working much more like a, like a sculptor would work with working with steel and doing a scale version, a maquette of a large um, steel sculpture because the steel will work in the same way if you scale it down in terms of thickness. Uh, you want to? 
Yeah, I mean, thank you everyone for the amazing presentations. I, uh, I just want to ask a more kind of general question that has to do with uh, how we uh, convert or how we approach this problem that this, the, the conference puts forward uh, in an educational space. So what are the um, kind of the key things that we have to dismantle or to challenge uh, or to rethink in order to move beyond the kind of conventional understandings of, I mean, all of you already mentioned very important points, right? Things that have to do with so-called context, with so-called you know, time frame, um, um, reality versus representation, or you know, building versus drawing or whatever. So, so I, to, to me, it's it's more a question of you know how a form of practice like yours you think has uh, or could be uh, thought within an educational environment and what this would entail and what would you think would be the kind of first acts of necessary acts to put forward in order to uh, challenge, uh, not just in a school of architecture, might be uh, other type of uh, educational environment within uh, um, say situated practices or, or art practices as well, right? It's not just that, you know, I'm not asking this question just for um, an, within an architectural school, I'm asking it more like, as a question of, of method and pedagogy, not as a question of architecture uh, or not, right? Yeah, thank you. I think it's a it's a really important question. And I think it's, it's one that, you know, after you've taught enough studios, and you've kind of gotten over the initial <laughs> like, uh, romantics of the fact that students make work, once you get over that, and then you start to, to really think, well, how can they challenge those, those norms? And what can they make that's going to, to increase the communication of what they're trying to do. And Platon, you know this very well, but in my own classes, the, the focus is, is trying to get the students to think non-representationally. And of course, in a, in a design studio, you have to represent your ideas. You have to, to, to make drawings that are, allow us to imagine a building or a place or a city but at the same time there can be other things to express that don't have to be conveyed through a projective medium and but that's much more difficult and and i think when students are able to do that when they start to produce things that don't have to stand in for something else um that's when i think the that's when I think an academic environment becomes truly um, experimental, right? I think in a lot of ways, we, we, we can't really call ourselves experimental if we're just talking about the next piece of software or, or, or we, have to, we have to kind of think about what are the, the objects that they're creating and that becomes really exciting. So that, that's how I would, I would kind of respond to that, but that that you know that that becomes very um, you know Miles used the word performative. That's obviously something that 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 we can start to challenge the students to make. You know, what would be a performative response to a project, one that doesn't have to to describe in a traditional way a space or a situation, but instead um, describes it to us in a in a narrative way or in a, in a, um, in a truly ephemeral performative way. I think those, those are, that can be fun. <laughs> That's a perfect answer for, uh, for that provocation. Uh, we have a final uh, question from Miguel in the chat for uh, all the presenters and if whomever feels like you can re uh, respond. Uh, he asks, uh, I'd like to know uh, what the presenters think about the digital spaces in which uh, we navigate nowadays, generally referred to as interfaces. Can or should they be subject to representation? Um, one of our uh, teachers and, and mentors um, uh, is uh, Andres Hake. Um, and, you know, 
he was always really um, emphatic that interface, the, the frame, any kind of technology at any scale, any sort of um, feature of the lived environment matters um, as much as maybe, you know, any other, or it has the potential to kind of matter as much. Um, and so, you know, from a very early on in our work, uh, we kind of declared like an equality between the building and the phone and um, any other kind of objects or technologies that might start to kind of shape our life. And indeed, if, if architecture um, through kind of spatial suggestion influences our behavior, so too does interface, absolutely. Um, so, you know, do you, is, is like the, is the kind of digital frame is like the YouTube interface so interesting? I don't know. I mean, like, you know, I've seen um, people, I think like Curtis Roth, uh, look at the kind of changing design of the Amazon um, interface and the way that actually it too now is a little bit uh, less fixed so that it is meant to kind of um, draw your attention to like add to cart and check out. And, um, and that actually, you know, those, the, the sort of shape of that um, surface um, shapes our behavior in really kind of precise uh, and immediate ways. So I, I don't think we can get away with ignoring them. You guys, uh, I'm afraid we can uh, we can stop here, and then uh, probably we can celebrate uh, your digital uh, presence with us. I, I really wish that you were all together, and we could have had a drink and and cheering up uh, all at AA, AA bar. But but sadly, we are uh, in this grid of digital uh, interface. But, but I think the good point was that we were all accessible. So uh, from four corners of the world, uh, we managed to come together and so, in such a great day, such a great afternoon, such an amazing discussion. I'm just, we are just grateful and thankful to all, all four of you. Uh, and on behalf of the school and students, basically. So thanks a lot. Your contribution meant a lot and it was amazing to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks, Ahmed. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Hopefully soon again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until then. Yes. And thanks for all the participants and who joined us for the entire afternoon.